Welcome back to Start Your Day. Uh, this next story is uh, one that almost uh, makes you not want to go on the Internet. And if you did and you saw it, you uh, had a visceral reaction. I was on Twitter, came across a video showing apparent neo-Nazis with swastika flags harassing patrons at the Red Ink Community Library in Providence, Rhode Island. Now, the library says its goal is to raise community voices, provide a safe space for people of all backgrounds, ethnicities, and sexual orientations, also to be a nexus of radical and revolutionary thoughts. Let's talk about it. We want to bring in one of uh, the library's directors, David Raylanu. Uh, uh, David, thank you for joining us. Wish you were joining us under different circumstances, but here we are. Uh, so you're there. You had this book club. This is happening. Walk us through what happened Monday night. Sure. So yesterday, uh, sorry, by Monday, February 21st, we were celebrating the 174th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto, a document that has uh, informed and, and guided principles of political thought for uh, now almost 200 years. And it's part of an international celebration called Red Books Day. We got started peacefully. Um, we were a small group reading the first chapter of the manifesto, and we had planned a, um, a discussion to happen afterwards. About 45 minutes in, though, we heard some loud banging on the glass at the front of the store, and, and we heard some shouting coming from the streets. It was immediately apparent that the people who showed up were wearing insignia and carrying flags associated with fascist and Nazi groups. So, yeah, when you see the, the, this flag, look at that flag right there. That's just evil. That's despicable. When you see that, what, what goes through your mind? And, and did you have any idea or heads up that this might happen, this kind of protest might happen? We had no clue whatsoever. When, as a person whose own Jewish heritage goes back more than 100 years in the city of Providence, it was a brutal sight to see, absolutely despicable. Um, I, I, I don't want to believe that something like that is possible, it, especially in a place like Rhode Island, but it, it clearly is. And um, it reinforces the mission of Reading Community Library to, to be a place of joy and celebration of socialist values, uh, to build community and uh, to foster education and knowledge and, um, and respect. Uh, because clearly it is the opponent of these hate groups. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Thursday, February 24, 2022. So I have been told this is our fourth study session on Philip K. Dix. The Man in the High Castle. We're picking up Chapter 9. Uh, we'll be going right to uh, Mr. Childen. Uh, we got kind of midway in Chapter 9 last week, so that's where we're picking up that this week. Uh, we started off the intro. That was just from a couple days ago. Uh, BNC News, uh, the Red Ink Community Library in Rhode Island being attacked. That just uh, gave... Uh, Reminded me so much of the book that we're reading right right now, having Nazi white supremacists uh, outside upset at a bookstore. Like, that's a big part of the theme uh, of this. The, the grasshopper lies heavy. That book is banned in the German chunk of the U.S., allowed, but uh, looked at kind of with the side eye. And people are like, hey, where'd you get this from? What are you doing with this type of thing? Um, so, yeah, just came to my attention. And then uh, they had some of the same paraphernalia, Nazi symbolism and what have you, that is uh, major throughout the text. Without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Context of white supremacy, Philip K. Dick, the man in the high castle, audio segment one. At the cash register, Robert Children looked up to see a lean, tall, dark-haired man entering the store. The man wore a slightly less than fashionable suit and carried a large wicker hamper, salesman. Yet he did not have the cheerful smile. Instead, he had a grim, morose look on his leathery face, more like a plumber or an electrician, Robert Shulden thought. When he had finished with his customer, Shulden called to the man, Who do you represent? Ed Frank Jewelry, the man mumbled back. He had set his hamper down on one of the counters. Never heard of them. Children sauntered over as the man unfastened the top of the hamper and with much wasted motion opened it. Hand-wrought, each unique, each an original, brass, copper, silver, even hot-forged black iron. Children glanced into the hamper, metal on black velvet, peculiar. 
No, thanks. Not in my line. This represents American artistry. Contemporary. Shaking his head no, Chilton walked back to the cash register. For a time, the man stood fooling with his velvet display boards and hamper. He was neither taking the boards out nor putting them back. He seemed to have no idea what he was doing. His arms folded, Chilton watched, thinking about various problems of the day. At two, he had an appointment to show some early period cups. Then at three, another batch of items returning from the Cal Labs, home from their authenticity test. He had been having more and more pieces examined in the last couple of weeks, ever since the nasty incident with the Colt 44. These are not plated, the man with the wicker hamper said, holding up a cuff bracelet. Solid copper. Children nodded without answering. The man would hang around for a while, shuffle his samples about, but finally he would move on. The telephone rang. Children answered it. Customer inquiring about an ancient rocking chair, very valuable, which Children was having mended for him. It had not been finished, and Children had to tell a convincing story. Staring through the store window at the midday traffic, he soothed and reassured. At last the customer, somewhat appeased, rang off. No doubt about it, he thought as he hung up the phone. The Colt 44 affair had shaken him considerably. He no longer viewed his stock with the same reverence. A bit of knowledge like that goes a long way. Akin to primal childhood awakening, facts of life. Shows, he ruminated, the link with our early years. Not merely U.S. history involved, but our own personal. As if, he thought, question might arise as to authenticity of our birth certificate, or our impression of Dad. Maybe I don't actually recall FDR as example. Synthetic image distilled from hearing assorted talk. Myth implanted subtly in tissue of brain. Like, he thought, myth of Heppelwhite, myth of Chippendale, or rather more on lines of Abraham Lincoln ate here. Used this old silver knife, fork, spoon. You can't see it, but the fact remains. At the other counter, still fumbling with his displays and wicker hamper, the salesman said, We can make pieces to order, custom made, if any of your customers have their own ideas. His voice had a strangled quality. He cleared his throat, gazing at Childen, and then down at a piece of jewelry which he held. He did not know how to leave, evidently. Childen smiled and said nothing. Not my responsibility, his to get himself back out of here. Place saved or no. Tough, such discomfort. But he doesn't have to be a salesman. We all suffer in this life. Look at me, taking it all day from Japs such as Mr. Tagomi. By merest inflection, managed to rub my nose in it, make my life miserable. And then, an idea occurred to him. Fellow's obviously not experienced. Look at him. Maybe I can get some stuff on consignment. Worth a try. Hey, Shulden said. The man glanced up swiftly, fastened his gaze. Advancing toward him, his arms still folded, Childen said, Looks like a quiet half hour here. No promises, but you can lay some of those things out. Clear back those racks of ties. He pointed. Nodding, the man began to clear himself a space on the top of the counter. He reopened his hamper, once more fumbled with the velvet trays. He'll lay everything out, Childen knew. Arrange it painstakingly for the next hour. Fuss and adjust until he's got it all set up. Hoping, praying, watching me out of the corner of his eye every second, to see if I'm taking any interest, any at all. When you have it out, Childen said, if I'm not too busy, I'll take a look. The man worked feverishly, as if he had been stung. Several customers entered the store then, and Childen greeted them. He turned his attention to them and their wishes, and forgot the salesman laboring over his display. The salesman, recognizing the situation, became stealthy in his movements. He made himself inconspicuous. Childen sold a shaving mug, almost sold a hand-hooked rug, took a deposit on an afghan. Time passed. At last the customers left. Once more the store was empty except for himself and the salesman. The salesman had finished. His entire selection of jewelry lay arranged on the black velvet on the surface of the counter. Going leisurely over... Robert Shulton lit a land of smiles and stood rocking back and forth on his heels, humming beneath his breath. The salesman stood silently. Neither spoke. At last, Shulton reached out and pointed at a pin. I like that. The salesman said in a rapid voice, That's a good one. You won't find any wire brush scratches. All rouge finished, and it won't tarnish. 
We have a plastic lacquer sprayed on them that'll last for years. It's the best industrial lacquer available. Sheldon nodded slightly. What we've done here, the salesman said, is to adapt tried and proven industrial techniques to jewelry making. As far as I know, nobody has ever done it before. No molds, all metal to metal, welding and brazing. He paused. The backs are hand soldered. Children picked up two bracelets, then a pin, then another pin. He held them for a moment, then set them off to one side. The salesman's face twitched. Hope. Examining the price tag on a necklace, Children said, "Is this retail? Your price is fifty percent of that, and if you buy, say, around a hundred dollars or so, we'll give you an additional two percent." One by one, Children laid several pieces aside. With each additional one, the salesman became more agitated. He talked faster and faster, finally repeating himself, even saying meaningless, foolish things, all in an undertone and very urgently. He really thinks he's going to sell. Children knew. By his own expression, he showed nothing. He went on with the game of picking pieces. That's an especially good one, the salesman said, rambling on, as Children fished out a large pendant and then ceased. I think you got our best, all our best. The man laughed. You really have good taste. His eyes darted. He was adding in his mind what Children had chosen: the total of the sale. Children said, "Our policy with untried merchandise has to be consignment." For a few seconds, the salesman did not understand. He stopped his talking, but he stared without comprehension. Children smiled at him. Consignment, the salesman echoed at last. Would you prefer not to leave it? Children said. Stammering, the man finally said, "You mean I leave it and and you pay me later on when you get two thirds of the proceeds when the pieces sell? That way you make much more. You have to wait, of course, but." Children shrugged. "It's up to you. I can give it some window display, possibly, and if it moves, then possibly later on in a month or so with the next order, well, we might see our way clear to buy some outright." The salesman had now spent well over an hour showing his wares. Children realized, and he had everything out, all his displays disarranged and dismantled. Another hour's work to get it back ready to take somewhere else. There was silence. Neither man spoke. Those pieces you put to one side, the salesman said in a low voice. They're the ones you want. Yes, I'll let you leave them all. Children strolled over to his office in the rear of the store. I'll write up a tag, so you'll have a record of what you've left with me. As he came back with his tag book, he added, "You understand that when merchandise is left on a consignment basis, the store doesn't assume liability in case of theft or damage." He had a little mimeograph release for the salesman to sign. The store would never have to account for the items left. When the unsold portion was returned, if some could not be located, they must have been stolen. Children declared to himself, "There's always theft going on in stores." Especially small items like jewelry, there was no way that Robert Children could lose. He did not have to pay for this man's jewelry. He had no investment in this kind of inventory. If any of it sold, he made a profit, and if it did not, he simply returned it all, or as much as could be found, to the salesman at some vague later date. Children made out the tag listing the items. He signed it and gave a copy to the salesman. "You can give me a call," he said, "in a month or so, to find out how it's been doing." Taking the jewelry which he wanted, he went off to the back of the store, leaving the salesman to gather up his remaining stuff. I didn't think he'd go along with it. He thought, "You never know. That's why it's always worth trying." When he next looked up, he saw that the salesman was ready to leave. He had his wicker hamper under his arm, and the counter was clear. The salesman was coming toward him, holding something out. Yes, Children said. He had been going over some correspondence. I want to leave our card. The salesman put down an odd-looking little square of gray and red paper on Children's desk. Ed Frank Custom Jewelry. It has our address and phone number. In case you want to get in touch with us. Children nodded, smiled silently, and returned to his work. When next he paused and looked up, the store was empty. The salesman had gone. Putting a nickel into the wall dispenser, Children obtained a cup of hot instant tea, which he sipped contemplatively. I wonder if it will sell. He wondered, very unlikely, but it is well made, and one never sees anything like it. 
He examined one of the pins. Quite striking design. Certainly not amateurs. I'll change the tags, mark them up a lot higher, push the handmade angle, and the uniqueness. Custom originals, small sculptures. Wear a work of art. Exclusive creation on your lapel or wrist. And there was another notion circulating and growing in the back of Robert Sheldon's mind. With these, there's no problem of authenticity. And that problem may someday wreck the historic American artifacts industry. Not today or tomorrow, but after that, who knows? Better not to have all irons in one fire. That visit by that Jewish crook, that might be the harbinger. If I quietly build up a stock of non-historic objects, contemporary work with no historicity, either real or imagined, I might find I have the edge over the competition. And as long as it isn't costing me anything... Leaning back his chair so that it rested against the wall, he sipped his tea and pondered. The moment changes. One must be ready to change with it, or otherwise left high and dry. Adapt. The rule of survival, he thought. Keep eye peeled regarding situation around you. Learn its demands, and meet them. Be there at the right time, doing the right thing. Be Yinnish, the Oriental knows. The smart black Yiddish eyes. Suddenly he had a good idea. It made him sit upright instantly. Two birds, one stone. Ah! He hopped to his feet, excited. Carefully wrapped best of jewelry pieces, removing tag, of course. Pin, pendant, or bracelet. Something nice, anyhow. Then, since have to leave shop, close up at two as it is. Saunter over to Kasura's apartment building. Mr. Kasura, Paul, will be at work. However, Mrs. Kasura, Betty will very likely be home. Graft gift, this new original U.S. artwork. Compliments of myself personally, in order to obtain high place reaction. This is how a new line is introduced. Isn't it lovely? Whole selection back at store, drop in, etc. This one for you, Betty. He trembled. Just she and I, midday in the apartment. Husband off at work. All on up and up, however. Brilliant pretext. Airtight. Getting a small box plus wrapping paper and ribbon, Robert Sheldon began preparing a gift for Mrs. Kasura. Dark, attractive woman, slender in her silk oriental dress, high heels, and so on. Or maybe today, blue cotton coolie-style lounging pajamas, very light and comfortable and informal. Ah, he thought. Or is this too bold? Husband Paul becoming irked, scenting out and reacting badly. Perhaps go slower. Take gift to him. To his office? Give much the same story, but to him. Then let him give gift to her. No suspicion. And, Robert Sheldon thought, then I give Betty a call on the phone tomorrow or next day to get her reaction. Even more airtight. When Frank Frink saw his business partner coming back up the sidewalk, he could tell that it had not gone well. What happened? he said, taking the wicker hamper from Ed and putting it in the truck. Jesus Christ, you were gone an hour and a half. It took him that long to say no? Ed said, He didn't say no. He looked tired. He got into the truck and sat. What'd he say then? Opening the hamper, Frank saw that a good many of the pieces were gone, many of their best. He took a lot. What's the matter then? Consignment, Ed said. You let him? He could not believe it. We talked it over. I don't know how come. Christ, Frink said. I'm sorry. He acted like he was going to buy it. He picked a lot out. I thought he was buying. They sat together silently in the truck for a long time. Chapter 10 It had been a terrible two weeks for Mr. Baines. From his hotel room, he had called the trade mission every day at noon, to ask if the old gentleman had put in an appearance. The answer had been an unvarying no. Mr. Takomi's voice had become colder and more formal each day. As Mr. Baines prepared to make his sixteenth call, he thought, sooner or later they'll tell me that Mr. Takomi is out, that he isn't accepting any more calls from me. And that will be that. What has happened? Where is Mr. Yatabi? He had a fairly good idea. The death of Martin Borman had caused immediate consternation in Tokyo. Mr. Yatabi, no doubt, had been en route to San Francisco, a day or so offshore, when new instructions had reached him. Return to the home islands for further consultation. Bad luck, Mr. Baines realized. Possibly even fatal. 
but he had to remain where he was, in San Francisco, still trying to arrange the meeting for which he had come. Forty-five minutes by Lufthansa rocket from Berlin, and now this. A weird time in which we are alive. We can travel anywhere we want, even to other planets. And for what? To sit day after day, declining in morale and hope, falling into an interminable ennui. And meanwhile, the others are busy. They are not sitting helplessly waiting. Mr. Baines unfolded the midday edition of the Nippon Times and once more read the headlines. Dr. Goebbels named Reich's Chancellor. Surprise solution to leadership problem by Partei Committee. Radio speech viewed decisive. Berlin crowds cheer. Statement expected. Goring may be named police chief over Heydrich. He reread the entire article, and then he put the paper once more away, took the phone, and gave the trade mission number. This is Mr. Baines. May I have Mr. Tagomi? A moment, sir. A very long moment. Mr. Tagomi here. Mr. Baines took a deep breath and said, Forgive this situation, depressing to us both, sir. Ah, Mr. Baines. Your hospitality to me, sir, could not be exceeded. Some day I know you will have understanding of the reasons which cause me to defer our conference until the old gentleman, regretfully, he has not arrived. Mr. Baines shut his eyes. I thought maybe since yesterday. Afraid not, sir. The barest politeness. If you will excuse me, Mr. Baines, pressing business. Good day, sir. The phone clicked. Today Mr. Tagomi had rung off without even saying goodbye. Mr. Baines slowly hung the receiver. I must take action. Can wait no longer. It had been made very clear to him by his superiors that he was not to contact the Abwehr under any circumstances. He was simply to wait until he had managed to make connections with the Japanese military representative. He was to confer with the Japanese, and then he was to return to Berlin. But no one had foreseen that Bormann would die at this particular moment. Therefore, the orders had to be superseded by more practical advice, his own in this case, since there was no one else to consult. In the PSA, at least ten of their persons were at work, but some of them, and possibly all, were known to the local SD and its competent senior regional chief, Bruno Kreutzbaum Mir. Years ago, he had met Bruno briefly at a party gathering. The man had had a certain infamous prestige in police circles, inasmuch as it had been he, in 1943, who had uncovered the British Czech plot on Reinhard Heydrich's life, and therefore who might be said to have saved the hangman from assassination. In any case, Bruno Kreutzbaum Mir was already then ascending in authority within the SD. He was not a mere police bureaucrat. He was, in fact, a rather dangerous man. There was even a possibility that even with all the precautions taken, both on the part of the Abwehr in Berlin and the Tokoka in Tokyo, the SD had learned of this attempted meeting in San Francisco in the offices of the ranking trade mission. However, this was, after all, Japanese-administered land. The SD had no official authority to interfere. It could see to it that the German principal, himself in this case, was arrested as soon as he set foot again on Reich territory, but it could hardly take action against the Japanese principal or against the existence of the meeting itself. At least, so he hoped. Was there any possibility that the SD had managed to detain the old Japanese gentleman somewhere along the route? It was a long way from Tokyo to San Francisco, especially for a person so elderly and frail that he could not attempt air travel. What I must do, Mr. Baines knew, is find out from those above me whether Mr. Yutabi is still coming. They would know. If the SD had intercepted him, or if the Tokyo government had recalled him, they would know that. And if they have managed to get to the old gentleman, he realized, they certainly are going to get to me. Yet the situation, even in those circumstances, was not hopeless. An idea had come to Mr. Baines as he waited day after day, alone in his room at the Aberati Hotel. It would be better to give my information to Mr. Tagomi than to return to Berlin empty-handed. At least that way there would be a chance, even if it is rather slight, that ultimately the proper people will be informed. But Mr. Tagomi could only listen. That was the fault in his idea. At best he could hear, commit to memory, and as soon as possible take a business trip back to the home islands. Whereas Mr. Yatabi stood at policy level, he could both hear and speak. Still, it was better than nothing. The time was growing too short. 
to begin all over, to arrange painstakingly, cautiously, over a period of months, once again, the delicate contact between a faction in Germany and a faction in Japan. It certainly would surprise Mr. Tagomi, he thought acidly, to suddenly find knowledge of that kind resting on his shoulders, a long way from facts about injection molds. Possibly he might have a nervous breakdown, either blurt out the information to someone around him, or withdraw, pretend even to himself that he had not heard it, simply refuse to believe me, rise to his feet, bow and excuse himself from the room the moment I begin. Indiscreet, he could regard it that way. He is not supposed to hear such matters. So easy, Mr. Baines thought. The way out is so immediate, so available to him. He thought, I wish it was for me. And yet, in the final analysis, it is not possible even for Mr. Tagomi. We are no different. He can close his ears to the news as it comes from me, comes in the form of words. But later, when it is not a matter of words, if I can make that clear to him now, or to whomever I finally speak, Leaving his hotel room, Mr. Baines descended by elevator to the lobby. Outside on the sidewalk, he had the doorman call a pedicab for him, and soon he was on his way up Market Street, the Chinese driver pumping away energetically. There, he said to the driver, when he made out the sign which he was watching for. Pull over to the curb. The pedicab stopped by a fire hydrant. Mr. Baines paid the driver and sent him off. No one seemed to have followed. Mr. Baines set off along the sidewalk on foot. A moment later, along with several other shoppers, he entered the big downtown Fuga department store. There were shoppers everywhere, counter after counter, salesgirls, mostly white, with a sprinkling of Japanese as department managers. The din was terrific. After some confusion, Mr. Baines located the men's clothing department. He stopped at the racks of men's trousers and began to inspect them. Presently a clerk, a young white came over, greeting him. Mr. Baines said, I have returned for the pair of dark brown wool slacks which I was looking at yesterday. Meeting the clerk's gaze, he said, You are not the man I spoke to. He was taller, red moustache, rather thin. On his jacket he had the name Larry. The clerk said, He is presently out to lunch, but will return. I'll go into a dressing room and try these on. Mr. Baines said, taking a pair of slacks from the rack. Certainly, sir. The clerk indicated a vacant dressing room and then went off to wait on someone else. Mr. Baines entered the dressing room and shut the door. He seated himself on one of the two chairs and waited. After a few minutes, there was a knock. The door of the dressing room opened and a short middle-aged Japanese entered. You are from out of state, sir, he said to Mr. Baines. And I am to okay your credit? Let me see your identification. He shut the door behind him. Mr. Baines got out his wallet. The Japanese seated himself with the wallet and began inspecting the contents. He halted at a photo of a girl. Very pretty. My daughter, Martha. I, too, have a daughter named Martha, the Japanese said. She at present is in Chicago studying piano. My daughter, Mr. Baines said, is about to be married. The Japanese returned the wallet and waited expectantly. Mr. Baines said, I have been here two weeks and Mr. Yatabi has not shown up. I want to find out if he is still coming, and if not, what I should do. Return tomorrow afternoon, the Japanese said. He rose and Mr. Baines also rose. Good day. Good day, Mr. Baines said. He left the dressing room, hung the pair of slacks back up on the rack, and left the Fuga department store. That did not take very long, he thought, as he moved along the busy downtown sidewalk with the other pedestrians. Can he actually get the information by then? Contact Berlin, relay my questions, do all the coding and decoding, every step involved? Apparently so. Now I wish I had approached the agent sooner. I would have saved myself such worry and distress. And evidently no major risk was involved. It had all appeared to go off smoothly. It took, in fact, only five or six minutes. Mr. Baines wandered on, looking into store windows. He felt much better now. Presently he found himself viewing display photos of honky-tonk cabarets, grimy, fly-specked, utterly white nudes, whose breasts hung like half-inflated volleyballs. That sight amused him, and he loitered, people pushing past him on their various errands up and down Market Street. 
At least he had done something at last. What a relief. Propped comfortably against the car door, Juliana read. Beside her, his elbow out the window, Joe drove with one hand lightly on the wheel, a cigarette stuck to his lower lip. He was a good driver, and they had covered a good deal of the distance from Cannon City already. The car radio played mushy beer garden folk music, an accordion band doing one of the countless polkas or shottishes. She had never been able to tell them one from another. Kitch, Joe said when the music ended. Listen, I know a lot about music. I'll tell you who a great conductor was. You probably don't remember him. Arturo Toscanini. No, she said, still reading. He was Italian, but the Nazis wouldn't let him conduct after the war because of his politics. He is dead now. I don't like that uh, von Karajan, permanent conductor of the New York Philharmonic. We had to go to concerts by him, our work dorm. What I like, being a wop, you can guess. He glanced at her. You like that book? He said. It's engrossing. I like Verdi and Puccini. All we get in New York is a heavy German bombastic Wagner and Orff, and we have to go every week to one of those corny U.S. Nazi Party dramatic spectacles at the Madison Square Garden with the flags and the drums and trumpets and the flickering flame. History of the Gothic tribes or other educational crap chanted instead of spoken so as to be called art. Did you ever see New York before the war? Yes, she said, trying to read. Didn't they have swell theater in those days? That's what I heard. Now it's the same as the movie industry. It's all a cartel in Berlin. In the 13 years I've been in New York, not one good musical or play ever opened. Only those... Let me read, Juliana said. And the same with the book business, Joe said, unperturbed. It's all a cartel operating out of Munich. All they do in New York is print, just big printing presses. But before the war... New York was the center of the world's publishing industry, or so they say. Putting her fingers in her ears, she concentrated on the page open in her lap, shutting his voice out. She had arrived at a section in the grasshopper which described the fabulous television, and it enthralled her, especially the part about the inexpensive little sets for backward people in Africa and Asia. Only Yankee know-how and the mass production system, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, the magic names could have done the trick, sent that ceaseless and almost witlessly noble flood of cheap one dollar, the China dollar, the trade dollar, television kits to every village and backwater of the Orient. And when the kit had been assembled by some gaunt, feverish-minded youth in the village, starved for a chance, for that which the generous Americans held out to him, that tinny little instrument with its built-in power supply no larger than a marble began to receive. And what did it receive? Crouching before the screen, the youths of the village, and often the elders as well, saw words, instructions, how to read first, then the rest, how to dig a deeper well, plow a deeper furrow, how to purify their water, heal their sick. Overhead, the American artificial moon wheeled, distributing the signal, carrying it everywhere, to all the waiting, avid masses of the East. Are you reading straight through? Joe asked. Or skipping around in it? She said, This is wonderful. He has us sending food and education to all the Asiatics, millions of them. Welfare work on a worldwide scale, Joe said. Yes, the New Deal under Tugwell. They raised the level of the masses. Listen, she read aloud to Joe. What had China been? Yearning, one needful, commingled entity looking toward the West. Its great democratic president, Chiang Kai-shek, who had led the Chinese people through the years of war, now into the years of peace, on to the decade of rebuilding. But for China, it was not rebuilding, for that almost supernaturally vast flat land had never been built, lay still slumbering in the ancient dream. Arousing, yes, the entity, the giant, had to partake at last of full consciousness, had to waken into the modern world with its jet airplanes and atomic power, its autobahns and factories and medicines. And from whence would come the crack of thunder which would rouse the giant? Chang had known that even during the struggle to defeat Japan. It would come from the United States. And by 1950, American technicians and engineers, teachers, doctors, agronomists, swarming like some new life form into each province, each... Interrupting, Joe said, You know what he's done, don't you? 
He's taken the best about Nazism, the socialist part, the Tot organization, and the economic advances we got through Speer. And who's he giving the credit to? The New Deal. And he's left out the bad part, the SS part, the racial extermination and segregation. It's a utopia. You imagine if the Allies had won, the New Deal would have been able to revive the economy and make those socialist welfare improvements like he says? Hell no. He's talking about the form of state syndicalism, the corporate estate, like we developed under the Duce. He's saying, you would have had all the good and none of... Let me read, she said fiercely. He shrugged, but he did cease babbling. She read on at once, but to herself. And these markets, the countless millions of China, set the factories in Detroit and Chicago to humming. That vast mouth could never be filled. Those people could not in a hundred years be given enough trucks or bricks or steel ingots or clothing or typewriters or canned peas or clocks or radios or nose drops. The American workmen, by 1960, had the highest standard of living in the world, and all due to what they genteely called the most favored nation clause in every commercial transaction with the East. The U.S. no longer occupied Japan, and she had never occupied China, and yet the fact could not be disputed. Canton and Tokyo and Shanghai did not buy from the British. They bought American, and with each sale, the working man in Baltimore or Los Angeles or Atlanta saw a little more prosperity. It seemed to the planners, the men of vision in the White House, that they had almost achieved their goal. The exploring rocket ships would soon nose cautiously out into the void from a world that had at last seen an end to its age-old griefs, hunger, plague, war, ignorance. In the British Empire... Equal measures towards social and economic progress had brought similar relief to the masses in India, Burma, Africa, the Middle East. The factories of the Ruhr, Manchester, of the Saar, the oil of Baku, all flowed and interacted to intricate but effective harmony. The populations of Europe basked in what appeared... I think they should be the rulers, Juliana said, pausing. They always were the best, the British... Joe said nothing to that, although she waited. At last she went on reading. Realization of Napoleon's vision, rational homogeneity of the diverse ethnic strains which had squabbled and balkanized Europe since the collapse of Rome. Vision, too, of Charlemagne, united Christendom, totally at peace, not only with itself, but with the balance of the world. And yet there still remained one annoying sore. Singapore. The Malay states held a large Chinese population, mostly of the enterprising business class, and these thrifty, industrious bourgeois saw in American administration of China a more equitable treatment of what was called the native. Under British rule, the darker races were excluded from the country clubs, the hotels, the better restaurants. They found themselves, as in archaic times, confined to particular sections of the train and bus and, perhaps worst of all, limited to their choice of residence within each city. These natives discerned, and noted in their table conversations and newspapers, that in the USA the color problem had by 1950 been solved. Whites and Negroes lived and worked and ate shoulder by shoulder, even in the Deep South. World War II had ended discrimination. Is there trouble? Juliana asked Joe. He grunted, keeping his eyes on the road. Tell me what happens, she said. I know I won't get to finish it. We'll be in Denver pretty soon. Do America and Britain get into a war, and one emerges as ruler of the world? Presently, Joe said, In some ways, it's not a bad book. He works all the details out. The U.S. has the Pacific, about like our East Asia co-prosperity sphere. They divide Russia. It works for around ten years. Then there's trouble, naturally. Why naturally? Human nature, Joe added. Nature of states, suspicion, fear, greed... Churchill thinks the USA is undermining British rule in South Asia by appealing to the large Chinese populations, who naturally are pro-USA, to the Chiang Kai-shek. The British start setting up, he grinned at her briefly, what are called detention preserves, concentration camps, in other words, for thousands of maybe disloyal Chinese. They're accused of sabotage and propaganda. Churchill is so... You mean he's still in power? Wouldn't he be around 90? Joe said, That's where the British system has it over the American. Every eight years the U.S. boots out its leaders, no matter how qualified. But Churchill just stays on. 
The U.S. doesn't have any leadership like him, after Tugwell, just non-entities. And the older he gets, the more autocratic and rigid he gets. Churchill, I mean. Until, by 1960, he's like some old warlord out of Central Asia. Nobody can cross him. He's been in power twenty years. Good God, she said, leafing through the last part of the book, searching for verification of what Joe was saying. On that I agree, Joe said. Churchill was the one good leader the British had during the war. If they'd retained him, they'd have been better off. I tell you, a state is no better than its leader. Fuhrer princip, principle of leadership, like the Nazis say. They're right. Even this Abinson has to face that. Sure, the USA expands economically after winning the war over Japan, because it's got that huge market in Asia that it's arrested from the Japs. But that's not enough. That's got no spirituality. Not that the British have. They're both plutocracies, ruled by the rich. If they had won, all they'd have thought about was making more money, the upper class. Abinson, he's wrong. There would be no social reform, no welfare public works plans. The Anglo-Saxon plutocrats wouldn't have permitted it. Juliana thought, spoken like a devout fascist. Evidently, Joe perceived by her expression what she was thinking. He turned toward her, slowing the car, one eye on her, one on the cars ahead. Listen, I'm not an intellectual. Fascism has no need of that. What is wanted is the deed. Theory derives from action. What our corporate state demands from us is comprehension of the social forces, of history. You see? I tell you, I know, Juliana. His tone was earnest, almost beseeching. Those old rotten money-run empires, Britain and France and USA, although the latter actually a sort of bastard side shoot, not strictly empire, but money-oriented even so, they had no soul, so naturally no future, no growth. Nazis, a bunch of street thugs, I agree. You agree, right? She had to smile. His Italian mannerisms had overpowered him in his attempt to drive and make his speech simultaneously. Abinson talks like it's a big issue as to whether U.S. or Britain ultimately wins out. Bull. Has no merit, no history to it. Six of one, a dozen of other. You ever read what the Duce wrote? Inspired, beautiful man, beautiful writing. Explains the underlying actuality of every event. Real issue in war was old versus new. Money. That's why Nazis dragged Jewish question mistakenly into it. Versus communal mass spirit what Nazis call Gemeinschaft, folkness, like Soviet, commune, right? Only communists sneaked in pan-Slavic Peter the Great Empire ambitions along with it, made social reform means for imperial ambitions. Juliana thought, like Mussolini did, exactly. Nazi thuggery, a tragedy, Joe stuttered away as he passed a slow-moving truck. But change is always harsh on the loser, nothing new. Look at previous revolutions such as French or Cromwell against Irish. Too much philosophy in Germanic temperament. Too much theater, too. All those rallies. You never find true fascists talking, only doing. Like me, right? Laughing, she said. God, you've been talking a mile a minute. He shouted excitedly. I'm explaining fascist theory of action. She couldn't answer. It was too funny. But the man beside her did not think it was funny. He glowered at her, his face red. Veins in his forehead became distended, and he began once more to shake. And again he passed his fingers clutchingly along his scalp, forward and back, not speaking, only staring at her. Don't get sore at me, she said. For a moment she thought he was going to hit her. He drew his arm back. But then he grunted, reached and turned up the car radio. They drove on, band music from the radio, static. Once more, she tried to concentrate on the book. You're right, Joe said after a long time. About what? Two-bit empire, clown for a leader. No wonder we got the nothing out of the war. She patted his arm. Juliana, it's all darkness, Joe said. Nothing is true or certain, right? Maybe so, she said absently continuing to try to read. Britain wins, Joe said, indicating the book. I save you the trouble. 
U.S. dwindles. Britain keeps needling and poking and expanding, keeps the initiative. So put it away. I hope we have fun in Denver, she said, closing the book. You need to relax. I want you to. If you don't, she thought, you're going to fly apart in a million pieces, like a bursting spring. And what happens to me, then? How do I get back? And do I just leave you? I want the good time you promised me, she thought. I don't want to be cheated. I've been cheated too much in my life before, by too many people. We'll have it, Joe said. Listen. He studied her with a queer, introspective expression. You take her to that grasshopper book so much. I wonder, do you suppose a man who writes a bestseller, an author like that, uh, Abinson, do people write letters to him? I bet lots of people praise his book by letters to him, maybe even visit. All at once she understood. Joe, it's only another hundred miles. His eyes shone. He smiled at her, happy again, no longer flushed or troubled. We could, she said. You drive so good, it'd be nothing to go on up there, would it? Slowly, Joe said, Well, I doubt the famous man lets visitors drop in. Probably uh, so many of them. Why not try? Joe! She grabbed his shoulder, squeezed him excitedly. All he could do is send us away. Please? With great deliberation, Joe said, when we've gone shopping and got new clothes, uh, all spruced up, that's important to make a good impression, and maybe even rent a new car up in Cheyenne. But you can do that. Yes, she said. And you need a haircut. And let me pick your clothes. Please, Joe. I used to pick Frank's clothes for him. A man can never buy his own clothes. You got the good taste in clothes, Joe said, once more turning toward the road ahead, gazing out somberly. In other ways, too. Better if you call him, contact him. I'll get my hair done, she said. Good. I'm not scared at all to walk up and ring the bell, Juliana said. I mean, you live only once. Why should we be intimidated? He's just a man like the rest of us. In fact, he probably would be pleased to know somebody drove so far just to tell him how much they liked his book. We can get an autograph on the book, on the inside where they do that. Isn't that so? we better buy a new copy. This one is all stained. It wouldn't look good. Anything you want, Joe said. I'll let you decide all the details. I know you can do it. Pretty girl always gets everyone. When he sees what a knockout you are, he'll open the door wide. But listen, no monkey business. What do you mean? You say we're married. I don't want you getting mixed up with him. You know, that would be dreadful. Wreck everyone's existence. Some reward for him to let visitors in. Some irony. So watch it, Juliana. You can argue with him, Juliana said. That part about Italy losing the war by betraying them? Tell him what you told me. Joe nodded. That's so. We can discuss the whole subject. They drove swiftly on. At seven o'clock the following morning, PSA reckoning, Mr. Nobusuki Tagomi rose from bed, started toward the bathroom, then changed his mind and went directly to the oracle. Seated cross-legged on the floor of his living room, he began manipulating the 49 yarrow stalks. He had a deep sense of the urgency of his questioning, and he worked at a feverish pace until at last he had the six lines before him. Shock! Hexagram 51. God appears in the sign of the arousing. Thunder and lightning. Sounds... He involuntarily put his fingers up to cover his ears. Ha-ha! Ho-ho! Great burst that made him wince and blink. Lizard scurries and tiger roars, and out comes God himself. What does it mean? He peered about his living room. Arrival of what? He hopped to his feet and stood panting, waiting. Nothing. Heart pounding. Respiration and all somatic processes, including all manner of diencephalic controlled autonomic responses to crisis. Adrenaline, greater heartbeat, pulse rate, glands pouring, throat paralyzed, eyes staring, bowels loose et al., stomach queasy and sex instinct suppressed. And yet, nothing to see. Nothing for body to do. Run? All in preparation for panic flight. But where to and why? Mr. Tagomi asked himself. No clue. Therefore impossible. 
Dilemma of civilized man, body mobilized but danger obscure. He went to the bathroom and began lathering his face to shave. The telephone rang. Shock, he said aloud, putting down his razor. Be prepared. He walked rapidly from the bathroom back into the living room. I am prepared, he said, and lifted the receiver. To go me here. His voice squeaked, and he cleared his throat. A pause, and then a faint, dry, rustling voice, almost like old leaves far off, said, Sir, this is Shinjiro Yatabi. I have arrived in San Francisco. Greetings from the ranking trade mission, Mr. Tagomi said. How glad I am. You are in good health and relaxed? Yes, Mr. Tagomi. When may I meet you? Quite soon, in half an hour. Mr. Tagomi peered at the bedroom clock, trying to read it. A third party, Mr. Baines. I must contact him. Possibly delay, but... Shall we say, two hours, sir? Mr. Yatabi said. Yes, Mr. Tagomi said, bowing. At your office in the Nippon Times building. Mr. Tagomi bowed once more. Click. Mr. Yatabi had rung off. Pleased Mr. Baines, Mr. Tagomi thought. Delight on order of cat tossed piece of salmon, for instance, fatty nice tail. He jiggled the hook, then dialed speedily the Adharati Hotel. Ordeal concluded, he said when Mr. Baines' sleepy voice came on the wire. At once the voice ceased to be sleepy. He's here? My office, Mr. Tacomi said. Ten twenty. Goodbye. He hung up and ran back to the bathroom to finish shaving. No time for breakfast. Have Mr. Ramsey scuttle about after office arrival completed. All three of us, perhaps, can indulge simultaneously. In his mind, as he shaved, he planned a fine breakfast for them all. In his pajamas, Mr. Baines stood at the phone, rubbing his forehead and thinking. A shame I broke down and made contact with that agent, he thought. If I had waited only one day more. But probably no harm has been done. Yet he was supposed to return to the department store today. Suppose I don't show up. It may start a chain reaction. They'll think I've been murdered or some such thing. An attempt will be made to trace me. It doesn't matter, because he's here at last. The waiting is over. Mr. Baines hurried to the bathroom and prepared to shave. I have no doubt that Mr. Tagomi will recognize him the moment he meets him, he decided. We can drop the Mr. Yatabi cover now. In fact, we can drop all covers, all pretenses. As soon as he had shaved, Mr. Baines hopped into the shower. As water roared around him, he sang at the top of his lungs, Der right set so spat, doch nacht und den wind, es ist der Wasser mit seinem Kind. It is probably too late now for the SD to do anything, he thought, even if they find out. So perhaps I can cease worrying, at least the trivial worry, the finite, private worry about my own particular skin. But as to the rest, we can just begin. Chapter 11 For the Reich's consul in San Francisco, Freiherr Hugo Reis, the first business of this particular day was unexpected and distressing. When he arrived at his office, he found a visitor waiting already, a large, heavy-jawed, middle-aged man with pocked skin and disapproving scowl that drew his black, tangled eyebrows together. The man rose and made a partai salute, at the same time murmuring, Heil. Rice said, Heil. He groaned inwardly, but maintained a businesslike formal smile. Herr Kreutz von Mir, I am surprised. Won't you come in? He unlocked his inner office, wondering where his vice-consul was, and who had let the SD chief in. Anyhow, here the man was. There was nothing to be done. Following along after him, his hands in the pockets of his dark wool overcoat, Kreutz von Mir said, Listen, Freiherr, we located this Abwehr fellow, this Rudolf Wegener. He showed up at the old Abwehr drop we have under surveillance. Kreutz von Mir chuckled, showing enormous gold teeth. And we trailed him back to his hotel. Fine, Rice said, noticing that his mail was on his desk. So Furderhoff was around somewhere. No doubt he had left the office locked to keep the SD chief from a little informal snooping. This is important, Kreutz von Mir said. 
I notified Kottenbrunner about it. Top priority. You'll probably be getting word from Berlin any time now. Unless those Unrath fressers back home get it all mixed up. He seated himself on the consul's desk, took a wad of folded paper from his coat pocket, unfolding the paper laboriously, his lips moving. Kaffer name is Baines, posing as a Swedish industrialist, or a salesman, or something connected with manufacturing. Received a phone call this morning at 8.10 from Japanese official regarding appointment at 10.20 in the Jap's office. We are presently trying to trace the call. Probably will have it traced in another half hour. They'll notify me here. I see, Rice said. Now, we may pick up this fellow, Kreutz von Mir continued. If we do, they'll naturally send him back to the Reich aboard the next Lufthansa plane. However, the Japs or Sacramento may protest and try to block it. They'll protest to you if they do. In fact, they may bring enormous pressure to bear. And they'll run a the truckload of those Tokoko Tufts to the airport. You can't keep them from finding out? Too late. He's on his way to a disappointment. We may have to pick him up right there on the spot. Run in, grab him, run out. I don't like that, Rice said. Suppose his appointment is with some extremely high-placed Jap officials. There may be an emperor's personal representative in San Francisco right now. I heard a rumor the other day. Kreutz von Mir interrupted. It doesn't matter. He's a German national, subject to Reich's law. And we know what Reich's law is, Rice thought. I have a commando squad ready, Kreutz von Mir went on. Five good men, he chuckled. They look like violinists, <laughs> nice ascetic faces, soulful, maybe like divinity students. They'll get in. The Japs will think they're a string quartet. Quintet, Rice said. Yes, they'll walk right up to the door. They're dressed just right. He surveyed the consul. Pretty much as you are. Thank you, Rice thought. Right in plain sight, broad daylight, up to this Wegener, gather around him, appear to be conferring message of importance. Kreutz von Mir droned on while the consul began opening his mail. No violence, just Herr Wegener, come with us, please. You understand. And between the vertebrae of his spine, a little shaft, pump, upper ganglia paralyzed. Rice nodded. Are you listening? Ganz bestimmt. Then out again, to the car, back to my office. Japs make a lot of racket, but polite to the last. Kreutz von Mir lumbered from the desk to pantomime a Japanese bowing. Most vulgar to deceive us, Herr Kreutz von Mir. However, goodbye, Herr Wagner. Baines, Rice said. Isn't he using his cover name? Baines, so sorry to see you go. Plenty more talk next time. The phone on Rice's desk rang, and Kreutz von Mir ceased his prank. That may be for me. He started to answer it, but Rice stepped to it and took it himself. Rice here. An unfamiliar voice said, Consul, this is the Ausland Fernsprachamt at Nova Scotia. Transatlantic telephone call for you from Berlin. Urgent. All right, Rice said. Just a moment, Consul. Faint static, crackles. Then another voice, a woman operator. Konzlei? Yes, this is Ausland Fernsprachamt at Nova Scotia. I have a call for the Reichskonsul H. Rice, San Francisco. I have the consul on the line. Hold on. A long pause, during which Rice continued with one hand to inspect his mail. Kreutz von Mir watched slackly. Herr Consul, sorry to take your time. A man's voice. The blood in Rice's veins instantly stopped its motion. Baritone, cultivated, rolling out smooth voice, familiar to Rice. This is Dr. Goebbels. Yes, Counselor. Across from Rice, Kreutz von Mir slowly showed a smile. The slack jaw ceased to hang. General Heydrich has just asked me to call you. There is an agent of the Abwehr there in San Francisco. His name is Rudolf Wigner. You are to cooperate fully with the police regarding him. There isn't time to give you the details. Simply put your office at their disposal. Ich danke Ihnen sehr dabei. I understand, Herr Kanzler, Rice said. 
Good day, Consul. The Reich Consular rang off. Kreutz von Mir watched intently as Reich hung up the phone. Was I right? Reich shrugged. No dispute there. Write out an authorization for us to return this Wegner to Germany forcibly. Picking up his pen, Reich wrote out the authorization, signed it, handed it to the SD chief. Thank you, Kreutz von Mir said. Now, when the Jap authorities call you and complain, if they do, Kreutz von Mir eyed him. They will. They'll be here within fifteen minutes of the time he picks his Wegner up. He had lost his joking, clowning manner. No string quintet violinists, Rice said. Kreutz von Mir did not answer. We'll have him sometimes this morning, so be ready. You can tell the Japs that he's a homosexual or a forger or something like that. Wanted for a major crime back home. Don't tell them he's wanted for political crimes. You know they don't recognize 90% of national socialist law. I know that, Rice said. I know what to do. He felt irritable and put upon. Went over my head, he said to himself, as usual. Contacted the chancery, the bastards. His hands were shaking. Call from Dr. Goebbels. Did that do it, awed by the mighty? Or is it resentment, feeling of being hemmed in? God damn these police, he thought. They get stronger all the time. They've got Goebbels working for them already. They're running the Reich. But what can I do? What can anybody do? Resignedly, he thought, better cooperate. No time to be on the wrong side of this man. He can probably get whatever he wants back home, and that might include the dismissal of everybody hostile to him. Context of white supremacy, Gusty Renegade. Uh, so we ended first audio segment. We are still in chapter 11. Chapter 11. Uh, we will pick up. Uh, let's see. So right in the middle of the uh, exchange here with uh, Kraus von Meer. Right. Uh, so I think we stopped. However, Kraus von Meer looked pleased. Thank you, counsel. That's what we should be picking up at once we get back uh, for the next audio segment. Reese Kraus von Meer. Right. That's what we'll be picking up at uh, chapter 11. Uh so the number, folks have commentary. First portion of uh, The Man in the High Castle, the number is 720-716-7300. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Number again, 720 Seven one six seven three hundred. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. The email until justice at gmail dot com. Until justice at gmail dot com. Uh, get to emails first, then see if folks have uh, commentary to share. Uh, I will just say really quick, I shared a study guide. I know several folks said this is not the easiest book to read for many, many reasons. Uh, but I've shared a study guide. Uh, they have many, right? You can just uh, search Man in the High Castle book. Make sure you put that in book because it'll be way different if you get like a study guide or something for the uh, TV series. Uh, but there are many of them out there for free, and they'll kind of walk you through each chapter and the characters and plot summaries and everything you like. Uh, some of them even will give you a nice little tidy World War II summary of, like, actual World War II history so you'll know who some of these folks are, like uh, Joseph Goebbels, you know. Uh, and some of the rest of the folks who are real people uh, who've been mentioned throughout the book and, you know, what actually happened in World War II so you'll know what got changed and what's, you know, legit. Uh, but anywho, uh, I took one of the quizzes from one of the sites where they have the study guides. And I said, I posted, I acknowledged I was a little too excited. 
I got a 92 percent, uh, 23 correct out of 25 questions, which would be a solid A, most uh, grading scales. Um, I said I was a little too excited, but this is not the uh, easiest book. Uh, and I've said pretty consistently for all of the folks, because the only reason we're reading this book is because we had lots of listeners who voted to read this book. The only reason that we're reading this is because folks wanted to read it. This is not a book that you can kind of be just casual and kind of listen for five minutes and then drop out like this is one you really would have to pay attention Um probably even have the book with you to really get as much information as you possibly could. And I think even some uh, other listeners uh, acknowledged this and saying, man, can't really uh, multitask. You really got to lock in, pay attention on this. Yes. Yes. Not like the TV show at all. Uh, before I get to, or last thing I'll say before I get to some of the folks who wrote in uh, that man, oh man, if this book, had never been on Amazon, I strongly suspect we would not be reading it now because no one would have picked this book. Just speculation. Until justice at gmail dot com. One of our listeners wrote in, she says Uh oh, now see, that's what I mean, like this book there's quite a bit that you could pick up on that directly relates to racism, white supremacy, but you would really have to be paying attention. And I think you would probably have to have the book to pick up on some of these things, because I said before, something is off about the language in this book. And I said, that's a pattern in science fiction. Uh, if you read or you could watch the movie, but I mean, reading it really sticks out. Planet of the Apes, that's a big theme in all the films. I said that before, and even some of the other movies where people, white people generally, and their ability to talk or inability sometimes is kind of like, oh man, that's a part of the sci fi downer of all this. Like, man, and we can't talk. Jesus Christ. So, our investor, she writes in, I just wanted to submit some of my thoughts for this week. Notice the way that people speak in the text, the sentences seem incomplete yes very frequently the articles of speech are missing such as the and a but I think the only people that I have noticed speaking in this unusual manner are the white people who are subject to the so called Japanese and the Japanese themselves I think the Japanese speak English in this manner because it's not their primary language but the white people who do it are imitating the dominant group. Now, that's interesting as to why this is. Example, Robert Children on page 57 says, I possess finest stock imaginable of Civil War weapons. No, the I will be happy to serve admirable Harusha. Shall I gather superb collection of such and bring aboard Sakuya? No, them. The words in parentheses were left out. A, B, them. Uh, now, while I understood what he was saying just fine, it's not the way I'm used to hearing white people speak. He sounds like a so-called Asian, and I think it was written deliberately like this by the author, absolutely. And Philip K. Dick is just illustrating to the reader yet another way people react to domination. The language portion is mentioned in some of the study guides where they talk about this and why is this being done what is this saying, uh, signifying but you would really have to pay attention to like literally each word continues page 161 in the book when Mr. Baines seems to be agonizing over what to do because Mr. Yatabi hasn't appeared, he shows a pretty good understanding of how people tend to react when you speak truthfully to them about a reality they had not hitherto understood. Possibly, he might have a nervous breakdown, either blurt out the information to someone around him, or withdraw, pretend, even to himself, that he had not heard it simply refuse to believe me those were super valid concerns and it shows an understanding of typical thought patterns and behavior 
especially in response to information viewed as troubling. Know all about that. Uh, I think the the phrase RAD acronym for racism avoidance disorder, where non-white people have been conditioned, traumatized, really terrorized that too to not talk about racism, white supremacy and don't know how to re- nervous breakdown pretend that this information is not accurate, refuse to believe it very typical responses and this is even uh, this is a big theme in a lot of Philip K. Dick's writing about what is reality and how do people respond to conflicting realities and even trying to figure out what is so called real Right, uh, a lot of people say that he kind of influenced the Matrix and those type of sci-fi films that became really popular years, years after uh, Mr. Even after he was dead, years. Uh, let's see. Continuing, also earlier in the story on page seventy-six, Mr. Tagomi says to Mr. Baines, "You are a neutral. Give me your opinion, if you will, toward the old, the sick, the feeble, the insane, the useless in all variations." Of what use is a newborn baby? Some Anglo-Saxon philosopher repeatedly asked, I have committed that utterance to memory and contemplated it many times. Mr. Baines murmured some sound or other. He made the noise of non-committal politeness. Now, it didn't say that what noise Mr. Baines made, but I thought of, hmm from the word God. Mr. Fuller wrote in part, hmm, use this sound in the form of an almost quiet humming as a way of responding to remarks whenever you prefer not to express a response of any kind. The sound itself should be intentionally meaningless and yeah, People could be considered ignorant and useless in their infancy, but most people understand that babies should be protected from harm. Most correct thinking people absolutely do seem to understand. Even animals, it seems, they have some evidence that, yes, babies and animals that are injured or old or feeble, maybe they can't do anything per se, but they are still valued and, more importantly, they shouldn't be mistreated. Uh, incidentally, the person who makes this uh, non-committal noise that Mr. Baines, that is important because uh, if you have not picked it up right, Mr. Baines is a spy. So he is going to be very codified about everything he does. He would be the one to be that precise with what he says. Every word counts. They may figure out. I'm a spy. Let's see. On page 165, it shows Juliana has a high level of focus on reading The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. Everyone in this book is reading that. And once she started reading it, it was hard for Joe, the WAP, to distract her. She told him several times, let me read. She even put her fingers in her ears to shut Joe's voice out and concentrate on her goal objective that's another pair to to kind of pay attention to like hmm is everything what it seems in this couple here some of the things in the grasshopper lies heavy are pretty interesting page 166 but for china it was not a rebuilding for that almost supernaturally vast flat land had never been built the idea that there wasn't a china built before world war ii is preposterous racism Uh, next American technicians and engineers teachers doctors agronomists swarming like some new life form into each province the description of white people as a new life form swarming like an infestation of insects insects was striking I think mr. dick understands what it means to be white more than I do, absolutely. Has anyone or any place ever rid themselves of a white infestation? Not to my knowledge. If so, I would like to know who, where, when, and how. 
Page 168, the exploring rocket ships would soon nose cautiously out into the void from a world that had at last seen an end to its age-old griefs, hunger, plague, war, ignorance. I thought the Grasshopper book was supposed to be a description of the way things really went during and after World War II. Those problems have not been solved, and I have a hard time seeing how they could be solved while white supremacy still exists. Maybe the author was saying these problems had been solved for white people. I wasn't sure how to take it. Now that is a cure, because I think he even uh, in that section he has a long passage about how white, oh she goes, yeah, keep reading. Page 168, under British rule, the darker races were excluded from the country clubs the hotels, the better restaurants, they found themselves as an archaic times confined to particular sections of the train and bus, perhaps back of the bus, perhaps worst of all, limited in their choice of residence within each city. These natives discerned and noted in their table conversations and newspapers that in the USA, the color problem had been by 1950 solved. Whites and Negroes lived and worked and ate shoulder by shoulder, even in the Deep South. That doesn't happen today, 2022. World War II had ended discrimination. That's laughable. This passage was... <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. This passage was almost laughable. Almost. The idea that Negroes, being in close proximity to whites, somehow solved the race problem or keeps whites from practicing racism is nonsensical and the person who wrote that passage was not and logically could not be ignorant about racism I would even say pause right there this book was published in 1962 Philip K. Dick hung out with the Black Panthers he lived in Berkeley did drugs all that right there he P. Newton Bobby Seale Angela Davis right there he knew 1962, so this is one year before the March on Washington, before the bombing of the Birmingham Church, 1963, and President Kennedy's assassination, one year before all that. Um, I'm sure Philip K. Dick knew that World War II did not end white supremacy racism. So, uh, what? why would he say something like that? Why would he have that in a book? that is uh, within his book this is the alternate universe right uh, the allies lost uh, the USA is great British wins they win the war the allied powers will be um, this is what things look like and supposedly things are so the euphoria is so incredible that racism were, you had black people who were being hung in the middle of World War Two because they violated some sort of code in Australia. We had whole documentaries about that, Black Soldier Blues. But again, Philip K. Dick knew this. So why does he have that in this book that everybody in the book is talking about? That's in the study guide, too, where they talk about that. Like, isn't that crazy? You have an alternate history book where all of these people within the book are reading an alternate history book and giving their different appeals and opinions and all the rest of it, like isn't that crazy? Like, and then the alternate history book is allegedly our universe, and even that one is not at deliberately inaccurate, saying that there's no racism. Like, are you serious? Something that they, that's why I said there is quite a bit here to process. But I mean, if you're not really reading the book or following along. You pretty much probably have to be reading along with the book. If you're not really following it closely, then, you know, hey, you could just watch the television show, which is not this at all. Uh, let's see. Continuing. I think they should be the rulers, Juliana said, talking about the British. They always were the best. Mm. And that's what she's <laughs> right in line all the way. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I actually don't understand why the so-called allies in World War II, so that's like uh, the state, uh, the U.S., the U.K., Russia, that whole team, 
fought Germany. It seems like the Germans were doing what white people all over the planet have been doing for centuries, and it seems like they learned quite a bit from the whites in the so-called U.S. Does anyone else understand this? Uh, my understanding is that white pe- uh, the so-called Germans, they were having their disputes, and when they began invading Poland and these other areas, uh, they started harming white people, like they invaded France, like they white people had agreements about how these regions are supposed to be governed, uh, where their boundaries are, and you know who's supposed to be in charge and all that. Germany was not, I guess, respecting those rules, uh, and so they had their squabble amongst themselves. Uh, that's that would be another one where I would say Mr. Fuller, he would love this because he is a World War II buff. I am not. He lived through all of this. I mean, he knows all of these people's names and studied all of this. Man, you could probably hang out with Mr. Fuller and he would be overjoyed to give you like a nice, comprehensive, accurate telling of now why were white people upset with Germany? Why did they feel like this warranted war? And break it down and and give it to you in the context of white supremacy racism which was really what it was all about but the gist of it I would just say is yeah they not respecting the rules that white people had set out in terms of how the global plantation was supposed to be operated uh, just a squabble about how they were going to run things uh, and they started harming invading other so called white countries and that had to be stopped like you got to respect uh, white laws, white boundaries, all of that. Behave yourself, that type of a thing. Uh, let's see. Did anyone figure out if Miss Euphrikian was white or non-white? She wasn't even mentioned this week. I totally forgot about it from last week. I said that, like, ooh, we should think about that. And then I was moving forward to so many crazy characters. I have to go back and uh, re-examine, or maybe she'll come up in the book again. We'll get to see it naturally when she pops up and we can, because the book seems to make it pretty plain who is white and who is not white. So I'll look and see if she's going to come up again, then I'll just wait and, you know, we'll bump into her when we bump into her. If not, then I'll go back and at least give my view. Uh, And another thought about Mr. Tagomi, I cannot think of one time in the text when he did anything that was on the list of 10 stops. This is more evidence to me that he is the protagonist. Now, that's interesting. Hmm. Did he did anything? Let's see. Does he name call? Mr. Children, the white guy who owns the shop, he does chink this and all the rest of it. He doesn't do... Yeah, he doesn't name call the Germans or anybody else. He's not killing folks, you know? Uh, he's just trying to stay calm, uh, get, you know, up hopefully not have a nervous breakdown <laughs> and uh yeah hmm. i said in my opinion it almost at times reads like tagomi is the antagonist she said protagonist i'm saying that really all of the asian people read like they are all the antagonists the villains because they're talked about badly all the time uh, and in contrast to white people, like their aerospace program isn't as good and they're lame and they're monkeys and Japs and all. I mean, that does not sound like a protagonist to me, but hey, I'm wrong. Uh, let's see. I have more notes, but I wanted to get this to you before the program starts. Uh, thank you for reading the book. I think the story has been really interesting so far. Much obliged. This is one of the people who did vote for the book. I did ask uh for folks to share with me online, uh, the people who voted for this book, what have they learned from the book uh, why, and why they wanted to read this book. Uh, thus far, I've only had uh, <laughs> people being silly in the replies. I've not heard anyone share back yet, so I would love to know. I, my theory, again, like I said, if Amazon had not made this a series we wouldn't be reading this book because folks would have voted for something else. We'd be reading Picking Cotton or, you know, something. Anywho, uh, let's see. Folks who dialed in, uh, if y'all have thoughts to share on the first chunk of reading, uh, let's see, spectating. I want this to be duly noted as we proceed with the book club. When people say, dang, Gus, you don't vote anymore, you don't let us pick on the book, this will be in the archive as to why 
voting for a book and then not participating, that right there is exactly why. Let's see. I did take notes. And like I said, there is, you know, quite a bit, you know, in the book directly about racism. But it is not an easy book to read. Uh, It is not like the television show. And it is when you probably would need the book to pay uh, pay attention to, to, you know, be able to pick out things. Uh, If some if any folks out there do want the book, it's pretty easy to get. You can probably get it at the library. But if you need an e-copy, let me know. You can hook it up if you think that would help as uh, we uh, move along through the text. Let's see. Some of the notes that I took. Let's see. That ends up being, uh, I mean, really, that's a big thing in the system of white supremacy. We talk about that all the time in not being able to verify because white people are in charge and so much of their system is about deception. Sometimes it's hard to verify things. You know, We don't know how long the system of white supremacy racism uh, has been in existence. You had lots of uh, black slaves. Uh, if we remember from one of the books that we read where we did have participation, uh, the half has never been told. You had many black slaves. They didn't even know how old they are, were. They didn't have a birth certificate. Right in line with my highlight here. Uh, this is, make sure I get my characters uh, correct. Oh, this is Mr. Children. He says, uh, akin to primal childhood awakening facts of life shows he he ruminated the link with our early years not merely u.s let me give you the whole paragraphs no doubt about it he thought as he hung up the phone the colt 44 affair had shaken him considerably he no longer viewed his stock with the same reverence stock genetic terms by genetic annihilation and talking about a gun double entendre a bit of knowledge like that goes a long way, akin to primal childhood awakening. Facts of life shows he ruminated the link with our early years, not merely U.S. history involved, but our own personal, as if he thought question might arise as to authenticity of our birth certificate or our impression of dad. And at this, he's talking about finding out, like, wow, these guns are not authentic. In fact, they're fakes and find out this information has shaken him so much it's making him question everything even you know is my birth certificate real uh do i have is my father real (laughs) have i been lied to about anything else where you can't even grasp uh, what is truthful that is very akin to our situation in the system of white supremacy and this is a white man who is talking with this much uncertainty and uncertainty about a firearm again welsing moment uh let's see And again, all this is so matrix. He says, maybe I don't actually recall uh, FDR as example, synthetic image distilled from hearing assorted talk, myth implanted subtly in tissue of brain. That's another one where like the D's and A's have been eliminated where this does not sound like the normal expert white King's English that we're accustomed to hearing right all through here. Uh, But then same thing, like I said, the matrix, like you don't even know is Abraham Lincoln real? Is this some person that they made up? Like maybe the person that I think is Abraham Lincoln is not him. Very much the position of being in uh, subordination. Someone is in a powerful position over you and they can decide what's true, what's real, what's not, what isn't. Also reminds me in 1984 too, we read that George Orwell. Uh, Let's see. Mr. Children, he says, uh, He doesn't have to be a salesman. We all suffer in this life. Look at me taking it all day from Japs such as Mr. Tagomi by merest inflection managed to rub my nose in it. Make my life miserable. Now that's fascinating for a whole lot of reasons because that's another one that sounds kind of odd, right? Uh, And then taking it from Japs all day long, white anxiety and anger you hear a lot of that right now he could be talking about president obama and he says my merest inflection managed to rub my nose in it that's a fragment i don't even know that's not even a full sentence um but i know what he's saying you know my merest inflection that again that goes back to speaking if i say something wrong i'll get in trouble Again, Mr. Dick, he knows what it's like to be a victim of white supremacy as a black person you can say things sometimes you don't even have to say anything 
and you get in trouble. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then they come back to speech again. Uh, he says, one by one, children laid out several more or pieces of sides. So this is when uh, Ed McCarthy comes in. Ed McCarthy and Frank Fink, they're in the jewelry business. Again, this book is so, there's so much like flagrant, the stereotypes that are here. So uh, the, they are so-called Jewish and they're in the jewelry business and they make fake guns. So it's all the normal stereotypes associated with so-called Jewish people. Uh, so... Uh, Ed McCarthy goes in to Mr. Children. He's going to sell some of these pieces that they've made. Uh, Children laid several more pieces aside with each additional one. The salesman became more agitated. He talked faster and faster, finally repeating himself, even saying meaningless, foolish things, all in an undertone and very urgently. And he describes them as rambling. The, again, and I'm saying this is a pattern in these type of dystopian futures, you might want to call them, where white people are no longer as skilled with words. Rambling, and he ends up messing up. He ends up doing all this rambling and urgent talking. Children picks up on that, and then, bam, we're going to do this by consignment. Maybe some of the stuff gets lost. I'm not responsible for it. We sell what we sell. You come back and pick it up. <laughs> Whatever. Maybe you get your money. Maybe you don't. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to totally take advantage of this guy. Children's racism coming through like, hey, that's what we do here. I'm taking advantage of you all. I'm getting over on this one. Japs messing over me every day. At least I'm going to do. Uh, let's see. And he wastes his time. He does it in a way. You see how he gets them. He, he, he goes and he takes care of other customers, comes back, makes them take all this stuff out, lets him get all excited like a sailor's going to make. That's the exact same thing that happened to children before when he thought he was going to get a gun sale. And the guy says, ooh, this gun is a fake. And he goes from getting $15,000 to nothing. Same type of thing. He just pulls the same trick. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Yeah, and he knows. He already knows that he's going to swindle this guy. Like, yeah, I'm going to steal some of this or, you know, whatever. But I'm not responsible. We already signed that on receipt. So that's just a part of the hustle. Uh, let's see. Authenticity comes up. These are handmade. He says there was a notion circling around and growing in the back of Robert Children's mind. With these, there's no problem of authenticity. And that problem may someday wreck the historic American artifacts industry. Uh, and I think that's important because he's he's already saying like, dang, my guns are all fake. So, man, maybe a lot of these merchandise, a lot of this stuff is fake. People find that out like, oh, my gosh, we'll all be ruined. Uh, let's see. Deception. Uh, let's see. Next. They say there's a big duality. Many of the people that write about this book and major themes of the book, they talk about the contrast between the German uh, kind of industrial, logical, uh, kind of dogged way of going about doing things, uh, I guess methodically, uh, whereas the so-called Asian way of doing it, they might say the racist term oriental way is humility and spiritual and being in balance and Taoism, all they would say it's kind of a duality between those two uh, in the text. Something you can think about, I reckon. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh, when children, he goes through this, so he gets the jewelry and he says, hmm, Maybe I can take some of these pieces up to Betty. She'll very likely be at home. Now, he's already done all this. I don't like these Japs and their monkeys and all the rest of it. And went up, felt like a barbarian when he went and had dinner with Betty and Paul. We just read that last week, remember? Uh, and he talks about there's such a big difference between uh, white people and Asians. But he's still lusting after uh, Paul's wife. So he's, ooh. I'll go over and give her some jewelry while her wife is, or while her husband, Paul, isn't home. Yeah, like, what in the world? <laughs> like, uh, saying the whole world is the white man's brothel. We read that East, the West, and sex. So some things do not change, uh, regardless of what's happening in the book. Uh, let's see. And then he, he works it out. He says, hmm, I can just drop by and do this. He says it would be even better 
I can give it to her husband and then I can call to verify that she got it. So that way it all looks on the up and up. Nobody will be suspicious that I'm really trying to, you know, get in on his wife. Like, are you serious? Trifling all the way. Um, let's see. Next. And he highlights her being dark and oriental. And he's got his whole, like, uh, kind of Asian fetish about what she's going to be wearing and all the rest of it. Like, okay. Uh, let's see. Chapter 10. Oh, so this is where we get into Juliana and Joe. Uh, they're uh, kind of going over the bits of... Uh, the uh, the grasshopper lies heavy, which is uh, alluding to a Bible verse. Uh, and when they talk about the this book and and what is Philip K. Dick getting at with this book, uh, some of the different folks who write about this book and try to give interpretations. Uh, the Bible verse it's from Ecclesiastes. I have to pull it up to read you the specific verse, uh, but they think uh, it basically means you strive. You try to do your best, but there's always uh, a problem. Things fall apart. Uh, you know what you do? Things fall apart. There's always going to be problems. Like you can do your best, even if you succeed. Like eventually, you know, the empire will crumble, or there'll be some sort of other problem, or you know, even if it looks like things are going well, like it'll it'll mess up eventually. Even you know, giving your best efforts, um, that that's uh, kind of signifying. Because in the book, the grasshopper lies heavy the allies win uh, but we're sitting here, sitting here ridiculing like this is ridiculous <laughs> like uh, the allies win and racism yes it's still a problem and ignorance and all this other stuff and in fact one of the big questions people ask is in this book the uh, the Nazis win right how different are things from this book to what you actually have the Negroes are still mistreated you still have television you still have the space uh, travel, space wars, and all that that was happening in the 60s. Like, how different are things? Like, is this radically different, really, from the plantation that we have in 1960s with the other side winning World War II? Like, that's one of the other things people kind of say Philip K. Dick may be playing with uh, in this tech at text asking us to think about. Uh, let's see. Next. Make sure I didn't miss anything. The whole reading. Everybody, I think that too, like to, one, this is a white author who did a lot of drugs. Two, that is kind of interesting to have a book that is sci-fi. And then within that book, everybody is reading a sci-fi book and commenting on it. Like that is kind of wild. Um, yeah, you kind of have to ponder on that in terms of uh, just the the crate. They, that aspect is changed. If you watch the Amazon series, the book is a movie, I guess, because lots of white people don't read now either. So they had to switch it up all the way around. So uh, let's see. That's from chapter ten. Because it's been big big chunks of time going through this book and having lots of different characters going through it. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Tagomi, this is really important, the whole scene where Tagomi is going to meet with Baines. Uh, Baines has been trying to contact him and have you heard from Mr. Yatobi and uh, we, we need to talk to him, Mr. Yatobi, sorry. Uh, we need to talk to him, have you heard from him? He feels like Mr. Uh, Tagomi is kind of blowing him off and might not even want to talk to him and uh, he goes to the department store to try to get information to figure out what to do because uh, Mr. Baines is a spy. So he has, you know, kind of secret objective that he's trying to accomplish, got to be codified with everything. Uh, and finally, they hear from uh, Mr. Yatabi. Now they can have their meeting, get together so you can hear more, you know, what he's trying to accomplish as a spy. But it's really important if you're kind of following along in the story. Uh, let's see. Oh, the translation. So 
Mr. Baines, he goes to get into the shower. He's all excited. Mr. Yatavi's here, so he starts to sing. They have this in German and do not translate. I did uh, stop and look that up just so I could be informed. So the German translation, the song, I'm not going to do the German, but the German translation, where the translation is, Who rides so late through night and the wind? It's the father with his child. That's what he's singing uh, at the top of his lungs uh, in anticipation of going to this meeting. Um, Who rides so late through night and the wind? It's the father with his child. Not sure what that means. Keep that in mind as we continue on. Uh, Let's see chapter 11 anything to get in uh let's see okay so uh Cruz von Mir and Fuhrer Rice uh they're having this conversation I just told you so Baines is a spy they're trying to capture Baines uh, and so there's like all right we we think he's going to be meeting here we'll work it out uh, now, they do have a slight problem. I guess this meeting is happening in Japanese territory, uh, and so they don't have any sovereignty there, the Germans. Uh, so they say, well, hey, this guy's a German official, so we have uh, authority there, and we just capture him and, you know, move it along. And they say, hey, uh, we'll go. We'll stand next to him. We need to talk to you. And between the vertebrae of his spine, a little shaft, pump, upper ganglia paralyzed. Like, wow, that's what I mean. See, they are not about our chain. We're not going to consult the Oracle. We are about genocide and, you know, paralyzing folks and snatching them, kidnapping people and bringing them back to our territory. Like, total contrast here. Uh, Let's see. And then, like I said, in my view, it seems like the racism is getting more explicit as we move along. You all can let me know if I'm wrong. He says, uh, then out again to the car, back to my office. This is all Cruz von Mir. Japs make a lot of racket, but polite to the last. And then he mocks them. Cruz von Mir lumbered from the desk to Panama. I'm a Japanese bowing. Most vulgar to deceive us, Air Cruz von Mir. However, goodbye, Edward now. More, and that's why I said, to me, it seems, the so-called Japanese, the Asian characters, they are the antagonists. Everyone is mocking them all throughout the book and name calling them. And we don't even respect, you know, their marriages. You know, I'm trying to go in and steal his wife and all that. Like, it just doesn't seem like the Germans are talked about as though they are villains in this book. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Let's see. Any folks? uh, Retired firefighter in Florida. See if you have commentary to share before we get to our second audio segment. Should be with us, sir. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I I was just uh, calling in to uh, report report. Uh, uh, you know, of course, I have been participating uh, with this particular book, uh, but uh, I still uh, just because of something that I'm not participating in, I still uh, encourage you know everybody to participate that uh, that requested for the book to be uh read uh and uh because that's the, actually the right thing to do but uh uh I'm I'm just not a fan of uh fiction so to speak and uh like Mr. Fuller I am also a uh, World War 2 uh 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 person who uh would uh you know does the history uh study the history of World War 2 uh, although uh, I am nowhere close to being that old, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, but uh, for some reason, it gained an interest of mine when I was uh, in elementary school, as early as elementary school, you know, going to the library and getting books on this subject. Uh, so just about every one of the names uh, that uh, was brought brought up about the uh, members of 
actually, you know, they were members of the Nazi party also uh, that uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with, including uh, Mr. Goebbels <laughs> uh, and Borman. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, as far as the uh, the book where you really need to pay attention, yes, I, I agree. You really need to pay attention to it. Uh, sometimes, you know, books like that I'm, I'm not very interested in because I think uh, actually uh, the authors should make it their business to try to make things as, as uh, simple as possible if they can. Sometimes I think they actually work in the opposite <laughs> uh, because in my mind, World War II in itself, like, for instance, is not as complicated as is uh I think uh what I've been I've been listening to some of the readings that it's not as complicated as, as uh th this book makes it. But uh anyway, I still pay it, listen every now and then, you know, to the uh the readings. And uh, it's healthy to uh to, you know, read and study anyway, so just because I don't like it, that don't mean nobody else should uh have that thought, you know. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Much obliged, retired firefighter. Uh, Gus T is not a fan of fiction either. And you can tell that from the Cows Book Club. Ten years, we have yet to read ten works of fiction in the Cows Book Club in a decade and that includes this here book because we're almost done we only have two set really one and a half sessions left uh we don't even average one work of fiction per year yay <laughs> hey, i'm right there with a man brother a man brother like uh it is very even though we have done some right invisible man 1984 the hate you give shaft 2000 seasons but i mean woof it's not a whole lot more after that blue i think tony morrison got two more and after that man in the high castle you're not even going to get to 10 and we've had 10 years. We don't read fiction very often. So when we do, it should be out of this world. Invisible man. Now, now if, now if the fiction has a real life possibilities, it, it, it helps. It, 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 it encourages me to read it. You know, if it has a possibility that it could have happened, you know, not so much about it's impossible that something like this can actually take place or this really didn't take place. If it, if it has a realistic possibility, then, you know, I could accept it. But, you know, but, you know, uh, sometimes it gets too far away from me to uh, really uh, be interested, be interested in it. And uh, hopefully, the, hopefully, uh it, this this next thing that's actually going on don't turn into quote unquote World War Three. <laughs> I don't think that's coming. I don't. I haven't read this book, so I don't know what's coming. I do know some anti Asian violence is coming uh, in the text, so I am uh, looking forward to that. I don't know if that's this week or the last two. We don't have a whole lot left, but uh, yeah, fiction. It is lots of imagined, and again, just the simple hey, drug addict, white author mm. expect anything okay. uh, with that uh, we will shove off to our second audio segment we're in chapter 11 kind of the very early part of uh, chapter 11 uh, my view again I could be wrong but I asked and really only one person responded out, out of many many folks over you know a dozen who wanted to read this book why did you all want to read this book again? Hmm. My suspicion is because it was recently on television and there's no other reason. Anyway, oh. we will 
we'll get to the second audio segment. Uh, I will rest on that one because unless I hear something to the contrary over the next two weeks, there's no other logical reason why folks would pick this book. They watched it on television and thought it might be cool to read. And I've said again, the TV show is nothing like the book. Audio segment two of Philip K. Dix. The Man in the High Castle, per listener's request. Context of white supremacy, Gus 2 in the book, uh, Gus 2. Thank goodness, we're almost done. I can see, he said aloud, that you did not exaggerate the importance of this matter, Herr Polizeiführer. Obviously, the security of Germany herself hangs on your quick detection of this spy or traitor or whatever he is. Inwardly, he cringed to hear his choice of words. However, Kreutzfamir looked pleased. Thank you, Consul. You may have saved us all. Gloomily, Kreutzfamir said, Well, we haven't picked him up. Let's wait for that. I wish that call would come. I'll handle the Japanese, Rice said. I've had a good deal of experience, as you know. Their complaints... Don't ramble on, Kreutzfamir interrupted. I have to think... Evidently, the call from the Chancery had bothered him. He, too, felt under pressure now. Possibly this fellow will get away, and it will cost you your job, Consul Hugo Rice thought. My job, your job, we both could find ourselves out on the street any time. No more security for you than for me. In fact, he thought, it might be worth seeing how a little foot dragging here and there could possibly stall your activities, Herr Polizeiführer something negative that could never be pinned down. For instance, when the Japanese come in here to complain, I might manage to drop a hint as to the Lufthansa flight on which this fellow is to be dragged away, or, barring that, needle them into a bit more outrage by, say, just the trace of a contemptuous smirk, suggesting that the Reich is amused by them, doesn't take little yellow men seriously. It's easy to sting them, and if they get angry enough, they might carry it directly to Goebbels. All sorts of possibilities... The SD can't really get this fellow out of the PSA without my active cooperation. If I can only hit on precisely the right twist. I hate people who go over my head, Freiherr Rice said to himself. It makes me too damn uncomfortable. It makes me so nervous that I can't sleep. And when I can't sleep, I can't do my job. So I owe it to Germany to correct this problem. I'd be a lot more comfortable at night, and in the daytime, too, for that matter, if this low-class Bavarian thug were back home writing up reports in some obscure Gao police station. The trouble is, there's not the time. All I'm trying to decide how to... The phone rang. This time, Kreutzfarmir reached out to take it, and Consul Rice did not bar the way. Hello, Kreutzfarmir said into the receiver. A moment of silence as he listened. Already? Rice thought. But the SD chief was holding out the phone. For you. Secretly relaxing with relief, Royce took the phone. It's some school teacher, Kreutzvarmir said. Wants to know if you can give them scenic posters of Austria for their class. Toward eleven o'clock in the morning, Robert Children shut up his store and set off on foot for Mr. Paul Kasura's business office. Fortunately, Paul was not busy. He greeted Children politely and offered him tea. I will not bother you long. Children said after they had both begun sipping. Paul's office, although small, was modern and simply furnished. On the wall, one single superb print, Mokai's Tiger, a late thirteenth-century masterpiece. I'm always happy to see you, Robert, Paul said in a tone that held, Children thought, perhaps a trace of aloofness. Or perhaps it was his imagination. Children glanced cautiously over his teacup. The man certainly looked friendly, and yet... Children sensed a change. Your wife, Children said, was disappointed by my crude gift. I possibly insulted. However, with something new and untried, as I explained to you when I grafted it to you, no proper or final evaluation can be made, at least not by someone in the purely business end. Certainly you and Betty are in a better position to judge than I. Paul said, She was not disappointed, Robert. I did not give the piece of jewelry to her. Reaching into his desk, he brought out the small white box. It has not left this office. He knows, children thought, 
smart man, never even told her. So that's that. Now children realize, let's hope he's not going to rave at me. Some kind of accusation about my trying to seduce his wife. He could ruin me, children said to himself. Carefully, he continued sipping his tea, his face impassive. Oh, he said mildly. Interesting. Paul opened the box, brought out the pin, and began inspecting it. He held it to the light, turned it over and around. I took the liberty of showing this to a number of business acquaintances, Paul said. Individuals who share my taste for American historic objects or for artifacts of general artistic aesthetic merit. He eyed Robert Childen. None, of course, had ever seen such as this before. As you explained, no such contemporary work hitherto-fore has been known. I think, too, you informed that you are sole representative? Yes, that is so, Childen said. You wish to hear their reaction? Childen bowed. These persons, Paul said, laughed. Childen was silent. Yet I, too, laughed behind my hand, invisible to you, Paul said, the other day when you appeared and showed me this thing. Naturally, to protect your sang-froid, I concealed that amusement. As you no doubt recall, I remained more or less non-committal in my apparent reaction. Sheldon nodded. Studying the pin, Paul went on. One can easily understand this reaction. Here is a piece of metal which has been melted until it has become shapeless, it represents nothing, nor does it have design of any intentional sort. It is merely amorphous. One might say it is mere content, deprived of form. Children nodded. Yet, Paul said, I have for several days now inspected it, and for no logical reason I feel a certain emotional fondness. Why is that, I may ask? I do not even now project into this blob, as in psychological German tests, my own psyche, I still see no shapes or forms, but it somehow partakes of Tao. You see? He motioned children over. It is balanced. The forces within this piece are stabilized, at rest. So to speak, this object has made its peace with the universe. It has separated from it, and hence has managed to come to homeostasis. Children nodded, studied the piece, but Paul had lost him. It does not have wabi, Paul said, nor could it ever, but... He touched the pin with his nail. Robert, this object has wu. I believe you are right, Sheldon said, trying to recall what wu was. It was not a Japanese word. It was Chinese. Wisdom, he decided, or comprehension. Anyhow, it was highly good. The hands of the artificer... Paul said, had Wu, and allowed that Wu to flow into this piece. Possibly he himself knows only that this piece satisfies. It is complete, Robert. By contemplating it, we gain more Wu ourselves. We experience the tranquility associated not with art, but with holy things. I recall a shrine in Hiroshima, wherein a shinbone of some medieval saint could be examined. However, this is an artifact, and that was a relic. This is alive in the now, whereas that merely remained. By this meditation, conducted by myself at great length since you were last here, I have come to identify the value which this has in opposition to historicity. I am deeply moved, as you may see. Yes, Children said. To have no historicity, and also no artistic aesthetic worth, and yet to partake of some ethereal value, that is a marvel. Just precisely because this is a miserable, small, worthless-looking blob, that, Robert, contributes to its possessing Wu. For it is a fact that Wu is customarily found in least imposing places, as in the Christian aphorism, stones rejected by the builder. One experiences awareness of Wu in such trash as an old stick or a rusty beer can by the side of the road. However, in those cases, the Wu is within the viewer. It is a religious experience. Here, an artificer has put Wu into the object, rather than merely witness the Wu inherent in it. He glanced up. Am I making myself clear? Yes, Children said. In other words, an entire new world is pointed to by this. 
The name for it is neither art, for it has no form nor religion. What is it? I have pondered this pin unceasingly, yet cannot fathom it. We evidently lack the word for an object like this. So you are right, Robert. It is authentically a new thing on the face of the world. Authentic, children thought. Yes, it certainly is. I catch that notion, but as to the rest... Having meditated to this avail, Paul continued, I next called back in here the self-same business acquaintances. I took it upon myself, as I have done with you just now, to deliver an expostulation devoid of tact. This subject carries authority which compels an abandonment of propriety. So great is the necessity of delivering the awareness itself. I required that these individuals listen. Children knew that for a Japanese such as Paul, to force his ideas on other persons was an almost incredible situation. The result, Paul said, was sanguine. They were able to adopt under such duress my viewpoint. They perceived what I had delineated, so it was worth it. Having done that, I rested. Nothing more, Robert. I am exhausted. He laid the pin back in the box. Responsibility with me has ended. Discharged. He pushed the box to Children. Sir, it's yours, Children said, feeling apprehensive. The situation did not fit any model he had ever experienced. A high-placed Japanese lauding to the skies a gift grafted to him and then returning it. Children felt his knees wobble. He did not have any idea what to do. He stood plucking at his sleeve, his face flushing. Calmly, even harshly, Paul said, Robert, you must face reality with more courage. Blanching, Children stammered, I I'm confused by... Paul stood up, facing him. Take heed. The task is yours. You are the sole agent for this piece and others of its ilk. Also, you are a professional. Withdraw for a period into isolation. Meditate. Possibly consult the Book of Changes. Then study your window displays, your ads, your system of merchandising. Children gaped at him. You will see your way, Paul said. How you must go about putting these objects over in a big fashion. Children felt stunned. The man's telling me I'm obliged to assume moral responsibility for the Ed Frank jewelry. Crackpot neurotic Japanese worldview. Nothing less than number one spiritual and business relationship with the jewelry tolerable in the eyes of Paul Kusura. And the worst part of it was that Paul certainly spoke with authority, right out of dead center of Japanese culture and tradition. Obligation, he thought bitterly. It could stick with him the rest of his life once incurred, right to the grave itself. Paul had, to his own satisfaction anyhow, discharged his. But children's, ah, that regrettably had the earmark of being unending. They're out of their minds, children said to himself. Example, they won't help a hurt man up from the gutter due to the obligation it imposes. What do you call that? I say that's typical. Just what you'd expect from a race that, when told to duplicate a British destroyer, managed even to copy the patches on the boiler, as well as... Paul was eyeing him intently. Fortunately, long habit had caused children to suppress any show of authentic feelings automatically. He assumed a bland, sober expression, persona that correctly matched the nature of the situation. He could sense it there, the mask. This is dreadful, children realized. A catastrophe. Better, Paul had thought I was trying to seduce his wife. Betty, there was no chance now that she would see the piece, that his original plan would come off. Wu was incompatible with sexuality. It was, as Paul said, solemn and holy, like a relic. I gave each of these individuals one of your cards, Paul said. Pardon? Children said, preoccupied. Your business cards, so that they could come in and inspect other examples. I see, Children said. There is one more thing, Paul said. One of these individuals wishes to discuss this entire subject with you at his location. I have written out his name and address. Paul handed Children a folded square of paper. He wants his business colleagues to hear. Paul added, he is an importer. He imports and exports on a mass basis, especially to South America. Radios, cameras, binoculars, tape recorders, the like. 
Sheldon gazed down at the paper. He deals, of course, in immense quantity, Paul said. Perhaps tens of thousands of each item. His company controls various enterprises that manufacture for him at low overhead, all located in the Orient where there is cheaper labor. Why is he... Sheldon began. Paul said, Pieces such as this... He picked up the pin once more, briefly. Closing the lid, he returned the box to Sheldon. Can be mass-produced, either in base metal or plastic, from a mold, in any quantity desired. After a time, Sheldon said, What about Wu? Will that remain in the pieces? Paul said nothing. You advise me to see him? Sheldon said. Yes, Paul said. Why? Charms, Paul said. Sheldon stared. Good luck charms, to be worn, by relatively poor people. A line of amulets to be peddled all over Latin America and the Orient. Most of the masses still believe in magic, you know. Spells, potions. It's a big business, I am told. Paul's face was wooden, his voice toneless. It sounds, Sheldon said slowly, as if there would be a good deal of money in it. Paul nodded. Was this your idea? Sheldon said. No, Paul said. He was silent then. Your employer, Sheldon thought. You showed the piece to your superior, who knows this importer. Your superior, or some influential person over your head, someone who has power over you, someone rich and big, contacted this importer. That's why you're giving it back to me, Sheldon realized. You want no part of this. But you know what I know that I will go to this address and see this man. I have to. I have no choice. I will lease the designs, or sell them on a percentage basis. Some deal will be made between me and this party. Clearly out of your hands, entirely. Bad taste on your part to presume to stop me or argue with me. There is a chance here for you, Paul said, to become extremely wealthy. He continued to gaze stoically ahead. The idea strikes me as bizarre, Sheldon said, making good luck charms out of such art objects. I can't imagine it. For it is not your natural line of business. You are devoted to the savored esoteric. Myself, I am the same. And so are those individuals who will shortly visit your store, those whom I mentioned. Sheldon said, What would you do if you were me? Don't undervaluate the possibilities suggested by the esteemed importer. He is a shrewd personage. You and I... We have no awareness of the vast number of uneducated. They can obtain, from mold-produced identical objects, a joy which would be denied to us. We must suppose that we have the only one of a kind, or at least something rare, possessed by a very few, and, of course, something truly authentic, not a model or replica. He continued to gaze past children, at empty space. Not something cast by the tens of thousands... As he stumbled onto correct notion, Sheldon wondered, that certain of the historic objects in stores such as mine, not to mention many items in his personal collection, are imitations? There seems a trace of hint in his words, as if, in ironic undertone, he is telling me a message quite different from what appears. Ambiguity, as one trips over in the oracle. Quality, as they say, of the oriental mind. Sheldon thought, he's actually saying... Which are you, Robert? He whom the oracle calls the inferior man, or that other for whom all the good advice is meant? Must decide, here. You may trot on one way or the other, but not both. Moment of choice now. And which way will the superior man go? Robert Sheldon inquired of himself, at least according to Paul Kusura. And what we have before us here isn't a many-thousand-year-old compilation of divinely inspired wisdom, this is merely the opinion of one mortal, one young Japanese businessman. Yet, there's a kernel to it. Wu, as Paul would say. The Wu of this situation is this. Whatever our personal dislikes, there can be no doubt the reality lies in the importer's direction. Too bad for what we had intended. We must adapt, as the oracle states. And after all, the originals can still be sold in my shop. To connoisseurs, as for example Paul's friends... You wrestle with yourself, Paul observed. 
No doubt it is in such a situation that one prefers to be alone. He had started toward the office door. I have already decided. Paul's eyes flickered. Bowing, Children said, I will follow your advice. Now I will leave to visit the importer. He held up the folded slip of paper. Oddly, Paul did not seem pleased. He merely grunted and returned to his desk. They contained their emotions to the last, Sheldon reflected. Many thanks for your business help, Sheldon said as he made ready to depart. Some day I will, if possible, reciprocate. I will remember. But still the young Japanese showed no reaction. Too true, Sheldon thought, what we used to say. They are inscrutable. Accompanying him to the door, Paul seemed deep in thought. All at once he blurted, American artisans made this piece by hand, correct? Labor of their personal bodies? Yes, from initial design to final polish. Sir, will these artisans play along? I would imagine they dreamed otherwise for their work. I'd hazard they could be persuaded, Sheldon said. The problem to him appeared minor. Yes, Paul said. I suppose so. Something in his tone made Robert Sheldon take sudden note, a nebulous and peculiar emphasis there, and then it swept over Sheldon. Without a doubt he had split the ambiguity. He saw. Of course, whole affair a cruel dismissal of American efforts, taking place before his eyes. Cynicism, but God forbid he had swallowed hook, line, and sinker, got me to agree step by step, led me along the garden path to this conclusion, Products of American hands good for nothing but to be models for junky good luck charms. This was how the Japanese ruled, not crudely, but with subtlety, ingenuity, timeless cunning. Christ, we're barbarians compared to them, children realized. We're no more than boobs against such pitiless reasoning. Paul did not say, did not tell me, that our art was worthless. He got me to say it for him, and as a final irony, he regretted my utterance. Faint, civilized gesture of sorrow as he heard the truth out of me. He's broken me, Children almost said aloud. Fortunately, however, he managed to keep it only a thought. As before, he held it in his interior world, apart in secret, for himself alone. Humiliated me and my race, and I'm helpless. There's no avenging this. We are defeated, and our defeats are like this, so tenuous, so delicate, that we're hardly able to perceive them. In fact, we have to rise a notch in our evolution to know what ever happened. What more proof could be presented as to the Japanese fitness to rule? He felt like laughing, possibly with appreciation. Yes, he thought, that's what it is, as one hears a choice anecdote. I've got to recall it, savor it later on, even relate it. But to whom? Problem there. Too personal for narration. In the corner of Paul's office, a wastebasket. Into it. Robert Shulton said to himself, with this blob, this woo-ridden piece of jewelry. Could I do it? Toss it away? End the situation before Paul's eyes? Can't even toss it away, he discovered as he gripped the piece. Must not, if you anticipate facing your Japanese fellow man again. Damn them, I can't free myself of their influence, can't give in to impulse. All spontaneity crushed. Paul scrutinized him, needing to say nothing, the man's very presence enough. Got my conscience snared, has run an invisible string from this blob in my hands up my arm to my soul. Guess I've lived around them too long, too late now to flee, to get back among whites and white ways. Robert Sheldon said, Paul! His voice, he noted, croaked in sickly escape. No control, no modulation. Yes, Robert? Paul, I am humiliated. The room reeled. Why so, Robert? Tones of concern, but detached, above involvement. Paul, one moment. He fingered the bit of jewelry. It had become slimy with sweat. I am proud of this work. There can be no consideration of trashy good luck charms. I reject. Once more, he could not make out the young Japanese man's reaction, only the listening ear, the mere awareness. Thank you, however, Robert Sheldon said. Paul bowed. Robert Sheldon bowed. The men who made this, Sheldon said, 
our American proud artists, myself included, to suggest trashy good luck charms therefore insults us, and I ask for apology. Incredible prolonged silence. Paul surveyed him. One eyebrow lifted slightly, and his thin lips twitched. A smile. I demand, Sheldon said. That was all. He could carry it no further. He now merely waited. Nothing occurred. Please, he thought, help me. Paul said, Forgive my arrogant imposition. He held out his hand. All right, Robert Sheldon said. They shook hands. Calmness descended in Sheldon's heart. I have lived through and out, he knew. All over, grace of God, it existed at the exact moment for me. Another time? Otherwise, could I ever dare once more press my luck? Probably not. He felt melancholy, brief instant, as if I rose to the surface and saw, unencumbered. Life is short, he thought. Art, or something not life, is long, stretching out endless like concrete worm, flat, white, unsmoothed by any passage over or across it. Here I stand, but no longer. Taking the small box, he put the Ed Frank jewelry piece away in his coat pocket. Chapter 12 Mr. Ramsey said, Mr. Togomi, this is Mr. Yatabi. He retired to a corner of the office, and the slender, elderly gentleman came forward. Holding out his hand, Mr. Togomi said, I am glad to meet you in person, sir. The light, fragile old hand slipped into his own. He shook without pressing and released at once. Nothing broken, I hope, he thought. He examined the old gentleman's features, finding himself pleased. Such a stern, coherent spirit there. No fogging of wits. Certainly lucid transmission of all the stable ancient traditions. Best quality which the old could represent. And then he discovered that he was facing General Tadeki, the former Imperial Chief of Staff. Mr. Tagomi bowed low. General, he said. Where is the third party? General Tadeki said. On the double he nears, Mr. Tagomi said. Informed myself at hotel room. His mind utterly rattled. He retreated several steps in the bowing position, scarcely able to regain an erect posture. The general seated himself. Mr. Ramsay, no doubt still ignorant of the old man's identity, assisted with the chair, but showed no particular deference. Mr. Tagomi hesitantly took a chair facing. We loiter, the general said. Regrettably, but unavoidably. True, Mr. Tagomi said. Ten minutes passed. Neither man spoke. Hey, excuse me, sir, Mr. Ramsey said at last, fidgeting. I will depart unless needed. Mr. Tagomi nodded, and Mr. Ramsey departed. Tea, General, Mr. Tagomi said. No, sir. Sir, Mr. Tagomi said, I admit to fear. I sense in this encounter something terrible. The General inclined his head. Mr. Baines, whom I have met, Mr. Tagomi said, and entertained in my home, declares himself a Swede, yet perusal persuades one that he is in fact a highly placed German of some sort. I say this because... Please continue. Thank you. General, his agitation regarding this meeting causes me to infer a connection with the political upheavals in the Reich. Mr. Tagomi did not mention another fact his awareness of the general's failure to appear at the time anticipated. The general said, Sir, now you are fishing, not informing. His gray eyes twinkled in fatherly manner, no malice there. Mr. Tagomi accepted the rebuke. Sir, is my presence in this meeting merely a formality to baffle the Nazi snoops? Naturally, the general said. We are interested in maintaining a certain fiction. Mr. Baines is representative for Toram Industries of Stockholm, purely businessman, and I am Shinjiro Yatabi. Mr. Tagomi thought, and I am Tagomi. That part is so. No doubt the Nazis have scrutinized Mr. Baines' comings and goings, the general said. 
He rested his hands on his knees, sitting bolt upright, as if Mr. Tagomi thought he was sniffing far-off beef tea odor. But to demolish the fiction, they must resort to legalities. That is the genuine purpose, not to deceive, but to require the formalities in case of exposure. You see, for instance, that to apprehend Mr. Baines, they must do more than merely shoot him down, which they could do were he to travel as, well, travel without his verbal umbrella. I see, Mr. Tagomi said. Sounds like a game, he decided. But they know the Nazi mentality, so I suppose it is of use. The desk intercom buzzed, Mr. Ramsey's voice. Sir, Mr. Baines is here. Shall I send him on in? Yes, Mr. Takomi cried. The door opened, and Mr. Baines, sleekly dressed, his clothes all quite pressed and masterfully tailored, his features composed, appeared. General Tadeki rose to face him. Mr. Takomi also rose. All three men bowed. Sir, Mr. Baines said to the general, I am Captain R. Wegner of the Reich's Naval Counterintelligence. As understood, I represent no one but myself and certain private unnamed individuals, no departments or bureaus of the Reich government of any sort. The general said, Herr Wegner, I understand that you in no way officially allege representation of any branch of the Reich government. I am here as an unofficial private party who, by virtue of former position with the Imperial Army, can be said to have access to circles in Tokyo who desire to hear whatever you have to say. Weird discourse, Mr. Tagomi thought, but not unpleasant. Certain near-musical quality to it. Refreshing relief, in fact. They sat down. Without preamble, Mr. Baines said, I would like to inform you and those you have access to that there is in advanced stage in the Reich a program called Lovenzon, Dandelion. Yes, the general said, nodding as if he had heard this before, but, Mr. Tagomi thought, he seemed quite eager for Mr. Baines to go on. Dandelion, Mr. Baines said, consists of an incident on the border between the Rocky Mountain states and the United States. The general nodded, smiling slightly. U.S. troops will be attacked and will retaliate by crossing the border and engaging the regular RMS troops stationed nearby. The U.S. troops have detailed maps showing Midwest Army installations. This is step one. Step two consists of a declaration by Germany regarding the conflict. A volunteer detachment of Wehrmacht paratroopers will be sent to aid the U.S. However, this is further camouflage. Yes, the general said, listening. The basic purpose of Operation Dandelion, Mr. Baines said, is an enormous nuclear attack on the home islands without advance warning of any kind. He was silent then. With purpose of wiping out royal family, home defense army, most of imperial navy, civil population, industries, resources, General Tadeki said, leaving overseas possessions for absorption by the Reich. Mr. Baines said nothing. The general said, What else? Mr. Baines seemed at a loss. The date, sir, the general said. All changed, Mr. Baines said, due to the death of M. Borman, at least I presume. I am not in contact with the Ob there now. Presently the general said, Go on, Herr Wegner. What we recommend is that the Japanese government enter into the Reich's domestic situation, or at least that was what I came here to recommend. Certain groups in the Reich favor Operation Dandelion. Certain others do not. It was hoped that those opposing it could come to power upon the death of Chancellor Bormann. But while you were here, the general said, Herr Bormann died, and the political situation took its own solution. The Dr. Goebbels is now Reich Chancellor. The upheaval is over. He paused. How does that faction view Operation Dandelion? Mr. Baines said, Dr. Goebbels is an advocate of Dandelion. Unnoticed by them, Mr. Tagomi closed his eyes. Who stands opposed? General Tadeki asked. Mr. Baines' voice came to Mr. Tagomi. SS General Heydrich. I am taken by a surprise, General Tadeki said. I am dubious. Is this legitimate information or only a viewpoint which you and your colleagues hold? 
Mr. Baines said, Administration of the East, that is, the area now held by Japan, would be by the Foreign Office, Rosenberg's people working directly with the Chancery. This was a bitterly disputed issue in many sessions between the principals last year. I have photostats of notes made. The police demanded authority, but were turned down. They are to manage the space colonization, Mars, Luna, Venus. That's to be their domain. Once this division of authority was settled, the police put all their weight behind the space program and against Dandelion. Rivalry, General Tadeki said. One group prayed against another by the leader, so he is never challenged. True, Mr. Baines said. That is why I was sent here, to plead for your intervention. It would still be possible to intervene. The situation is still fluid. It will be months before Dr. Goebbels can consolidate his position. He will have to break the police, possibly have Heydrich and the other top SS and SD leaders executed. Once that is done... We are to give support to the Sekheidsdienst, General Tadecki interrupted. The most malignant portion of German society? Mr. Baines said... That is right. The Emperor, General Tadecki said, would never tolerate that policy. He regards the Reich Elite Corps, wherever the black uniform is worn, the death's head, the castle system, all to him is evil. Evil, Mr. Takomi thought. Yes, it is. Are we to assist it in gaining power in order to save our lives? Is that the paradox of our earthly situation? I cannot face this dilemma, Mr. Tagomi said to himself. That man should have to act in such moral ambiguity. There is no way in this. All is muddled. All chaos of light and dark, shadow and substance. The Wehrmacht, Mr. Baines said, the military, is sole possessor in the Reich of the hydrogen bomb. Where the black shirts have used it, they have done so only under army supervision. The Chancery under Bormann never allowed any nuclear armament to go to the police. In Operation Dandelion, all will be carried out by OKW, the Army High Command. I am aware of that, General Tadecki said. The moral practices of the Blackshirts exceed in ferocity that of the Wehrmacht, but their power is less. We should reflect solely on reality, on actual power, not on ethical intentions. Yes, we must be realists, Mr. Degomi said aloud. Both Mr. Baines and General Tadecki glanced at him. To Mr. Baines, the general said, What specifically do you suggest? That we establish contact with the SD here in the Pacific States? Directly negotiate with... I do not know who is SD chief here. Some repellent character, I imagine. The local SD knows nothing, Mr. Baines said. Their chief here, Bruno Kreutzbaum Mir, is an old-time party hack, an alt genosse, an imbecile. No one in Berlin would think of telling him anything. He merely carries out routine assignments. What then? The general sounded angry. The consul here, or the Reich's ambassador in Tokyo? This talk will fail, Mr. Togomi thought. No matter what is at stake, we cannot enter the monstrous schizophrenic morass of Nazi internecine intrigue. Our minds cannot adapt. It must be handled delicately, Mr. Baines said. Through a series of intermediaries, someone close to Heydrich, who is stationed outside of the Reich, in a neutral country, or someone who travels back and forth between Tokyo and Berlin. Do you have someone in mind? The Italian foreign minister, Count Siano, an intelligent, reliable, very brave man, completely devoted to international understanding. However, his contact with the SD apparatus is non-existent, but he might work through someone else in Germany. Economic interests, such as the Krupps, or through General Spidel, or possibly even through Waffen-SS personages. The Waffen-SS is less fanatic, more in the mainstream of German society. Your establishment, the Abwehr. It would be futile to attempt to reach Heydrich through you. The black shirts utterly revile us. They've been trying for twenty years to get Partei approval for liquidating us in toto. Aren't you in excessive personal danger from them? General Tadecki said. They are active here on the Pacific coast, I understand. Active, but inept, Mr. Baines said. The foreign office man, Rice, is skillful, but opposed to the SD. He shrugged. General Tadecki said, I would like your photostats to turn over to my government. 
any material you have pertaining to these discussions in Germany. And he pondered. Proof of objective nature. Certainly, Mr. Baines said. He reached into his coat and took out a flat silver cigarette case. You will find each cigarette to be a hollow container for microfilm. He passed the case to General Tadecki. What about the case itself? The General said, examining it. It seems too valuable an object to give away. He started to remove the cigarettes from it. Smiling, Mr. Bain said, The case, too. Thank you. Also smiling, the General put the case away in his top coat pocket. The desk intercom buzzed. Mr. Tagomi pressed the button. Mr. Ramsey's voice came. Sir, there is a group of SD men in the downstairs lobby. They are attempting to take over the building. The Times guards are scuffling with them. In the distance, noise of a siren. Outside the building, from the street below, Mr. Tagomi's window. Army MPs are on the way, plus San Francisco Kempai Tai. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey, Mr. Tagomi said. You have done an honorable thing to report placidly. Mr. Baines and General Tadecki were listening, both rigid. Sirs, Mr. Tagomi said to them, we will no doubt kill the SD thugs before they reach this floor. To Mr. Ramsey, he said, Turn off the power to the elevators. Yes, Mr. Tagomi. Mr. Ramsey broke the connection. Mr. Tagomi said, We will wait. He opened his desk drawer and lifted out a teakwood box. Unlocking it, he brought forth a perfectly preserved U.S. 1860 Civil War Colt 44, a treasured collector's item. Taking out a box of loose powder, ball and cap ammunition, he began loading the revolver. Mr. Baines and General Tadecki watched wide-eyed. Part of personal collection, Mr. Tagomi said. Much fooled around in vainglorious swift draw practicing and firing in spare hours. Admit to compare favorably with other enthusiasts in contest timing, but mature use heretofore delayed. Holding the gun in correct fashion, he pointed it at the office door and sat waiting. Context of White Supremacy 2 sessions left really one and a half uh, we'll have one full next week and then uh, like a half session two weeks from today all done incidentally this book is not even that long for there were some people who really wanted to read this book like a long time ago like for reals this book is so short you could have read it given us a counter racist review moved on the number is seven two zero seven one six seven three hundred the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate uh, email until justice at gmail dot com uh, let's see uh, we had a different person different investor uh, who wrote in uh, make sure I get their commentary as well. Uh, he wrote in, <clears throat> uh, Greetings, Gus. The reading once again seems timely with all the talk in white supremacy media that we may be on the brink of World War III and nuclear holocaust. At the very least, it is described as the largest European ground war since 1939. Everything in Ukraine, Russia. White people do get in tiffs every now and then. Uh, chapter 9, number 1. And then an idea occurred to him, fellows obviously not experienced. Look at him. Maybe I can get some stuff on consignment. Worth a try. Hey, children said. The man glanced up swiftly, fastened his gaze. Determining where you stand in the pecking order is important in order to determine who you can take advantage of in an unjust system. Number two, be Yenish. The Oriental knows. The smart black Yenish eyes, a term used to describe a group of poor vagrants who originated in Western Europe. Uh, chapter 10, <clears throat> that's Yenish, I believe. Chapter 10, number one, Mr. Baines got out his wallet. The Japanese seated himself with the wallet and began inspecting the contents. He halted at a photo of a girl, very pretty. My daughter, Martha, 
I, too, have a daughter named Martha, the Japanese said. The younger Japanese characters seem to have English first names, Paul, Betty, Martha. The author may be hinting that with subsequent generations, the Japanese will increasingly become white identified. I think there's a lot of that in the book, as he talked about, like, uh, last week, when Chilbin went to Betty, Betty and Paul, when he was talking about the neighborhoods, he was saying, like, they were playing football and everything. And I was like, wow, they playing, like, American football or soccer? either of which would kind of just, you know, further the white identification. And then they're collecting all the Mickey Mouse watches and Civil War artifacts, like lots of white identification Two, <clears throat> uh, She had arrived at a section in the Grasshopper, the inexpensive little sets for backward people in Africa and Asia. Only Yankee know-how and the mass production system, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, the magic names, crouching before the screen, the youths of the village, and often the elders as well, saw words, instructions, how to read first, oh, we talked about that reading thing language, then the rest, how to dig a deeper well, plow a deeper furrow, how to purify the water, heal their sick. When this book was first published, inexpensive Japanese products were flooding the U.S. market during the 1960s, and the phrase made in Japan was derogatory. Interesting how the author reimagines this history through a fictional book, now making the U.S. the good guys. When in reality, World War II ended, millions of Asians continued to be killed at the direction of the U.S. It is not clear to me what message the author is sending that is a good point especially like I said so this comes out in like 1962 like uh, hmm I don't know I mean he's uh, just Philip K. Dick is noted as someone who is really like anti-TV and very much felt that that would be a big part of the matrix and you know what is reality and kind of having people all uh oppressed and drugged out and all the rest of it not thinking uh was way again he was way against uh television so that's you know certainly one to include uh but yeah what what is he even the backwardness of black like even in grasshopper like after racism has been wiped out like or i guess this is a part of the wiping it out is this technology i guess that maybe it might be ridiculing that hey this is the kind of pollyanna way that we tell the story that we conquered racism v for victory in germany and v for victory over racism and you know came back and got our act together and little rock nine and all the rest of it um maybe he's ridiculing all of that, right? Like television going out and uh, he talks about the band of white people that went out, the infestation of white people that went out to do all this do good or helping in the world. Maybe he's ridiculing all of that in Grasshopper. Maybe. Not sure. We have to kind of think about that as we proceed along but I mean yes yeah, some of this is it's just like are you serious like this is nonsense <laughs> like I don't and and at times it's like this is the the revolutionary book uh in this text which I mean even that's something to think about like if it is and we're sitting like this is nonsense Philip K. Dick was hanging out the with the Black Panthers in the 60s so he would know this is nonsense too not ignorant about racism uh let's see Chapter 11, number one, it does not have wabi, simple beauty, Paul said, nor could it ever, but he touched the pen with his nail. Robert, this object has woo, holiness. These are the English translations I found. I am not sure how accurate they are. Uh, for woo, I found like flow. It, it was kind of... Uh, ambiguous repeat a term um but that seems kind of in line whatever that means holiness flow whatever that means even simple beauty whatever that means uh number two children felt stunned the man's telling me i'm obliged to assume more responsibility for the ed frank jewelry crackpot neurotic japanese worldview products of american hand goods for nothing but to be models for junky good luck charms 
this was how the Japanese ruled, not crudely, but with subtlety, ingenuity, timeless cunning. He's broken me. Children almost said aloud, for me, the most interesting part of the text is children's interactions with the Kasuras. I would agree there. That's like two weeks in a row, like at the dinner last week, where he called a monkey, said he was a barbarian, and all the rest, like fascinating scenes. The turmoil associated with his inner life and thoughts due to him now being in a subordinate power position is somewhat relatable. The main distinction, of course, being that he was introduced prior to the war in a system of racism, white supremacy, and thus practicing racism is his default operating system whenever a safe opportunity presents itself. Absolutely. And sometimes even when it's not safe, he can't help himself. He said that last week. Uh, three. The men who made this, children said, are American proud artists, myself included, to suggest trashy good luck charms, therefore insults us, and I ask for apology. I think children was being manipulated by Paul. Manipulated to get the apology or manipulated, you think, to get him to go and, and sell this cheap goods to his business partners or what have you? It's one maybe we'll get for next week. Uh, 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 uh. Chapter 12. Number one, however, the this is further camouflaged. The basic purpose of Operation Dandelion, Mr. Bain said, is an enormous nuclear attack on the home islands without advance warning of any kind. He was silent then, with purpose of wiping out royal family, home defense army, most of imperial navy, civilian population, industries, resources. This is such a defining principle of racism, white supremacy. The appetite for domination is insatiable. Even though the Nazis now dominate the entire planet except for a sliver of the United States and the Japanese homeland and have exterminated the black population almost, they did say they're not quite done on the continent, they are intent on moving on their so-called Japanese allies. And I said now, I've only seen like 1.5 episodes of the Amazon series. This seems more flagrant. The conflict, like the flagrant tension between the Japanese and the Germans, like, you know, you all are chinks. We think you're chinks too. So it's not like we're going to be homies for a long time. Like that is much more palpable in the TV series. Like from the very beginning, that doesn't seem to be as much the case here in the book, but they're not the same. Uh, let's see. Number two, at his desk, Mr. Tagomi pointed his Colt 44 ancient collector's item and compressed the trigger. Oop, we didn't get that far. Whoop, 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 whoop. Save that one for next week. Uh, really quick, before I get to some of my notes, I'll check the phone line as well. A different investor, she uh, shared, <clears throat> she or I uh, asked, why did folks who voted for this book uh, why did they want to read this book? What were they hoping to learn? And she wrote in to answer the question. She said also, in answer to the question of why I wanted to read this book, Dr. Welsing talked about it in her last lecture at Howard. If we're being super accurate, she didn't exactly talk about this book. She talked about the advertisements on the subway that were actually in connection to the Amazon series, not the book. Unless I'm misinformed, don't want to misspeak on the dead. Dr. Welsing had not read this book. And I did talk to Dr. Welsing. That was Gus T. If I give a hat tip to myself, uh, she got that information about this series and the swastikas on the subway from Gus T. Like literally, we, Cal's listeners, faxed that report to Dr. Welsing that she included and spoke on at the Welsing Institute in December of 2015. Uh, and I spoke with her about all that, where she asked, could you fax that to me? Uh, and she did not speak with me with the impression that she had read this book. So, hmm. all right. Anyway, uh, also, I read a couple of Philip K. Dick's short stories, and they were interesting. Now, that whew, I bet it's probably not five cows listeners who can truthfully say that they've read many of his short stories before they read this, because I haven't. 
uh, Beyond Lies the Wub. Never heard of that one. And The Second Variety, or that one. So I thought this would be interesting, too, even though it's fiction. I thought we'd be able to learn about the white people who call themselves Nazis. I did watch some of the show, but I don't think that's a negative. The stories aren't really the same. Yes, Lordy, the stories are not the same. Man, oh, man. Uh, All right, but that's one person. Uh, And you can't, I mean, wow. It is interesting. You can learn a lot. I guess for me, I would be in a much happier mood if I was either for some reason like personally motivated to read this book at this time, which I was not. If this was only so many people said they wanted to read this, um, I would probably and or if we had more engagement, like it is always a bummer for Gus T when listeners, uh, when we're reading a book that listeners say they want to read and then they, you know, check out and they're doing other things. Oh, oh. Man, talk about some name calling. Uh, Let me give out some of the notes that I took on this section. Much obliged for the folks who took time, investors, to write in. Some folks even two times. Uh, Let's see. So the notes I took for the second audio. Hmm. Flip back a little bit. Okay, here we go. For the second audio, so we picked up in chapter 11. I told you about the, the talking. So this comes back to the conversation with Reese and uh, Cruz Von Mir, uh, all these different wacky accents and such, like kudos to the person doing the narrating, like, wow, I would not want to have to narrate this book. Um, Cruz Von Mir chides uh, Reese about rambling on, so I said about not being codified with words, even though this is the Germans talking, they generally have their language together, uh, as the uh, one of our investors pointed out. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. They say I might manage to drop a hint as to the Lufthansa's flight on which this fellow Baines is to be dragged away, or barring that, needle them into a bit more outrage by, say, just the trace of contemptuous smirk, suggesting that the Reich is amused by them, doesn't take little yellow men seriously. It's easy to sting them, and if they get angry enough, they might carry it directly to Goebbels. And this, again, shows that kind of, you know, the white supremacy racism. You know, we don't really care about them either, and all this name-calling uh, and such in the book. Maybe Philip K. Dick is trying to point that out. That's the attitude of white people. Again, this is like basically less than a year before uh, the U.S. direct involvement in Vietnam, like direct official involvement in Vietnam, and then it's not that far removed from the Korean conflict and World War II, so lots of over- concentration clamps, uh, open flagrant anti-Asian violence and comments all the time this era. Uh, let's see, next. This whole exchange with the jewelry where children who's a white man goes to Paul. Now again, all of this was, I'm trying to holler at your wife. <laughs> that, I mean, there's nothing noble about this. This is not even like a business effort. This is, I'm trying to get at your non-white wife. Like cowbell, tragic arrangement, and tacky, super tacky at that. Um, and so then Paul is like, hey, you know, you got your tacky art and it doesn't have any history to it and all the rest of it. Um, but it's got woo. You have to look to see, you know, now what does that mean? Like a humility, spirituality, whatever this means. Like I said, that's that dichotomy, right? Because they spent all the time when Ed McCarthy and Frank Fink were constructing this jury. They spent all that time talking about this German meticulous equipment that they got to do all this really finely calibrated, precise measurements and jewelry, right? That's what they talked about. And he's saying that, oh, my God. There's no shape to it, and it's just a plop of nothing. And oh, it's got no history, and like totally degraded. But like, hey, it's amazing. It's so hum- like you should take these little trashy knickknacks and just make them into little, you know, uh, good luck charms, and you'll make a fortune. You know, selling these to those no count peasant people who believe in good luck and all that. And at first, uh, children is like, you know, all right, hey, gotta adapt. That's what we'll do. Okay, we'll make some money. All right, I'll meet you people. And then he steps back. Wait a minute. We are good. Now, they're so-called Jews. but We are white people. We made this, and he's telling us that it's junk, that we're just going to pedal like, hey, man, you're going to give us an apology right now. I mean, I, the whole time I think, like, hey, Mr. Fulanak, that is pitiful. Like, wow, the table, like, when do you see 
a white person begging a non-white person for an apology about anything. So what is it? How the mighty have fun. And then he even has the nerve. He doesn't just ask for an apology. He demands. Oh, oh, that was the most pitiful part of the exchange for me. Like, oh, my God. Like, oh, demand. And he gives it to like, you know what? My bad. My bad. I was arrogant. I apologize. <laughs> and they want to talk about easily stung and hurt feelings like, wow. Even if he was trying to manipulate him, like, wow. Anyway, and again, all this was not even about business. This was, I'm trying to holler at your Asian wife. Uh, let's see. And this is another one where Paul is talking to him and children are sitting there like, I don't even know what he's talking about. Remember last week when he was talking about jazz and all the rest of it and uh, Mr. Children kept messing up when he was at dinner with them, like messing up, saying the wrong things like, oh, I'm a barbarian. You kind of got some of the same uh, overtones this week. Like, I don't know what this chink is talking about. And, you know, what? And then he it even takes him a while to figure out that he's been insulted and then turn around and go back and try and clean and demand this apology. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, I mean, how wacky this is. They say the hands of the artificer, Paul said, had woo and allowed that woo to flow into this piece. Even what does it mean? Philip K. Dick writing all this about woo. Like, what <laughs> is he? Anyway, uh, possibly he himself knows only that this piece satisfies. It is complete, Robert. By contemplating it, we gain more woo ourselves. I kind of feel like Philip K. Dick is, you know messing with us here we experience the tranquility associated not with art but with joy with holy things I recall a shrine in Hiroshima wherein a shin bone of some medieval saint could be examined however this is an artifact and that was a relic this is alive in the now whereas that merely remained I just thought that was fascinating I mean for so many reasons Hiroshima you know being a global site of uh, white supremacy, racism, uh, Holocaust of a whole uh, different nature. And in this story, that didn't happen. So as opposed to there being Hiroshima, just the name itself being a shrine to uh, a, a, you want to use the word barbarian, that would certainly apply white barbarism uh, that was exclusively used against the non-white people. They didn't do the, the bombing against the Germans. <clears throat> that Hiroshima here is just a shrine to some medieval event, not a campaign of genocide against generations uh, of non-white people, so-called Japanese uh, specifically. Um, and that this is all mentioned in the, in the guise of this, talking about the so-called spirituality uh, of this piece of jewelry. Amazing. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mr. Children gets really outraged <laughs> about uh, all of this, uh, which I found amazing. Like these scenes, as I think one of our investors said, these scenes are amazing where it just seems like he gets so angry uh, as just being a white man in this position, having to kind of curry favor with these folks and, and, and loving this, uh, not having access to non sexual access to non white females on demand and then they have all this power over him like he just gets so frustrated like it seems like every time like he tries to keep it together as best he can and every time he ends up getting mad and either cursing them out in his head or doing it in real life and some type of thing uh, let's see anything else even he he comes back to it he says man there was no chance I was trying to seduce his, he says, I thought, uh, this is dreadful. Children realized a catastrophe. Better Paul had thought I was trying to seduce his wife. Betty, there was no chance now that she would see the piece that his original plan would come off. Woo was incompatible with sexuality. It was, as Paul said, solemn and holy like a relic. Now that's even something to think about that right there. Woo. Why would woo be incompatible with the creative force force 
of the universe that put us all here. Why would that be the case? Uh, is he trying to say something about, um, yeah, so-called uh, Asian people or what have you uh, with this? Being, yeah, I don't even know what to make of all that. That's just uh, one to ponder on. But, yeah, anyway, all of this coming back, this whole exchange, I'm trying to do some infidelity here with this Asian female who literally is above my station now. Uh, in this wacky world here and this is what comes of all of that and she never even sees the peace like catastrophe of the great and he gets insulted in the midst of all of this loses some sort of honor so called uh, let's see make sure I didn't miss any folks who had a hand up double check yep didn't see any hand didn't think so uh, any other notes that I took uh, the whole exchange, I guess we kind of didn't really get to get uh, all of the information that's going to come out from the exchange with uh, Baines. I told you he's a spy. You'll get all that information later. Uh, Baines and Yatabi and General Tadeki, like we kind of got in the middle of all of that. Uh, what do they call it? Cliffhanger uh, in the midst of all the drama. So that might be one uh, for next week. We can kind of wait and see everything that happens. Uh, with Baines, do they figure out who he is and what he's up to in all of this uh, for next week? Um, as I said, this book is kind of one of those where you really have to pay attention to figure out what's happening, who these people are. Some of these folks are lying, right? <laughs> They're uh, spies, so you have to kind of figure out what uh, the plot is, what the narrative is, and really kind of pay attention to it. And especially if you don't have the book, it can be kind of difficult to piece all of that together so if it's uh you know if you feel like it's worthy of your time and energy you can listen a few times check out the book check out the study session like i said that can be really helpful if you're confused about who some of the characters are or what the plot is what some of these wacky concepts are wabi and woo and all the rest of it like and how how they're being used uh, within the confines of Philip K. Dick's novel here. Check out the study guide. That can be really helpful. I've done that for all the sections, and that's kind of helped me make sure that I'm, you know, kind of together with uh, what's being written out here. Let's see. Let me make sure. I leave out any, miss out any good notes. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Mm, 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 mm. Christ were barbarians compared to them. That's two weeks in a row that he's uh, children has referred to himself and white people as barbarians, uh, where he's talking about how refined uh, the Japanese are for him coming in here with all of his spiritual talk and all the rest of it to kind of get him to just go and make these uh, trashy trinkets uh, to make some money as opposed to respecting their artwork. Uh, incidentally, I thought they were trying to make money. I didn't think they were, you know, trying to be respected jewelers, uh, but maybe I missed that. Uh, and he took this not just as a personal humiliation. He said that he humiliated me and my race. I thought that was really important. Uh, a white person taking offense for the entire white race. Like, wow. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then... He says, damn them, I can't free myself of their influence, can't give in to impulse, all spontaneity crushed. Paul scrutinized him, needing to say nothing. The man's very presence enough. Got my conscience snared, has run an invisible string from this blob in my hands up my arm to my soul. Guess I've lived around them too long. Too late now to flee, to get back among whites and white ways. What are white ways? <laughs> Break that down, <laughs> Philip K. Dick, like, wow. Robert Children said, Paul, his voice, he noted, croaked in sickly escape, no control, no modulation. Oh, and that's the one where his voice, yeah, he was like a immature child. Like, he's not even a man. That's why I said this was the most pitiful moment. I told you right there, his vo voice is cracking you know like he's going through puberty or something and all the way like, you are going to apologize to me coming here and insulting talking <laughs> and I'm like oh man white people have really fallen off uh, yeah let's see anything else we didn't really read a whole lot of 12 we'll finish all that up next week to get I just I thought I guess the one thing I get as the Nazi goons 
are uh, as the Nazi goons are about to break in and destroy the facility or what have you. Um, I thought it was important for many reasons that Tagomi pulls out his, what is it, his perfectly preserved U.S. 1860 Civil War Colt 44, number one, because of all the gun talk that's come up in the book. One, the first thing I was thinking was, ooh, is this a fake? <laughs> or is this like a real deal since we got all this uh, inauthenticity, running, inauthenticity running around? And then two, uh, the second thing was that uh, he's pulling out a Civil War gun This is technically like almost another civil war because you've got the Japanese occupied side, right? And they're having to fight this shootout gun battle with the German troops. So that's almost another little civil war type thing, right? That Philip K. Dick is kind of playing with right there. Uh, And then, yeah, he's pulling out his his fake or we don't know if it's fake or real or whatever. Who knows? (laughs) his gun. Now, none of that even matters. Now we just hope it fires. (laughs) I think uh, that is really the only thing that matters at all. I think Philip K. Dick might be playing with that as well. In fact, I know he is. I read that. They were like, uh, hey, whether this gun is a fake or not, even if it's fake, it could probably still kill someone. And that cliffhanger, we'll we'll hang at it for next week. Uh, For... The folks, I guess the people who wanted to read this book, who are listening and maybe commenting, not many. Uh, Hopefully it was constructive for the people who voted and didn't participate. Like, uh, shame on you. Anywho, we are almost done, so we'll wrap it up two weeks. We'll be here tomorrow for Neutralizing Workplace Racism, Saturday for the compensatory call-in. Much obliged for those who wrote in. Thank you kindly, making sure I didn't have to be by myself. And moral support from retired firefighter. That said, uh, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. In addition to being sober, if you're out and about, no time for verbal confrontations with strangers. You should be thinking, uh, hey, Ethan Crombley, they could be armed, have an entire armed entourage. If you did not leave your residence, prepare to kill and or die. Exit. If you're in a vehicle, you're sober buckled not on the cell phone we need all of our attention and we're trying to do the small things that we can to minimize contact with race soldiers badge or no all of that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cow signing out Thanks all for tuning in.